Question, Heather. That's bored. Relax, yes, sir. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. He has to be put down. He will defend his police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the law. We enforce it. And at the end of the day, each and every member should go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is December 6, 2016. We're coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at 6 o'clock Pacific, 9 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we just started doing the show at 6 about, I think this is the second week. So we're still trying that out on the Nonpartisan Liberty for All Media and Radio Network, which now runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can listen live on Spreaker.com and NonpartisanLibertyForAll.com and to the archives immediately following the show on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. On Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. And, of course, we're always happy to hear from you at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664. And you can check us out on Skype. Well, you can call in on Skype. You can reach us on Skype at username Nonpartisan Liberty for All. You can also check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All dot com, which has the links to all our social media, all our contact information. If you forget the number or the username, as well as our email address and various articles and blogs. So tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about the free market as I see it. At least that's kind of how it started out. So I believe I was talking about something on the show, and I think that's where the free market came up. And I wanted to talk about what I, how I define the free market because it's totally different as to what goes on today, and I've mentioned that before that there's never been a free market in the United States. I I don't think there's really been a free market anywhere, um, you know, at least in modern times. You know, years ago, before uh, governments like they have now, there may may have been some version of a free market, but there, uh, at least in you know, the past hundred years or whatever. And I don't know what goes on in other countries when it comes to stuff like that and how their, you know, black market economy goes, but that's not really their economy. So there's never been a free market, although people like to call what exists now in the United States uh, capitalism and they call it capitalism, but same thing to them. It means a free market and it's not. And what they do is they use that to attack capitalism and free markets. Now I don't really use the word capitalism anymore, but that's what they use. But 
it's essentially the same thing. So what they do is, oh, look what capitalism has done and look how fucked up uh, things are because of capitalism. Well, that's not what exists in the United States, and it's never been what exists in the United States. So at least since it became a country. So they can use that to demonize it and as a way to push socialism, which is, I think, the ultimate goal, you know, some combination of socialism uh, with an oligarchy and some fascism as well. But that's not how things work. But as I was saying, I came up with an idea to do a show on free markets and, of course, to go over, you know, the current uh, climate or current market and how that uh, essentially works or how I see it um, working and compare that to what a free market really is, in my opinion. But when I was, um, I looked up some stuff. I mean, of course, you know, I know what the free market is and all of that, but I just wanted to look up what other people were saying and make sure I'm not forgetting anything or leaving anything out. And I was, it's funny because I was actually watching this anyway before I thought of doing the show, uh, the Zeitgeist films. And the first one is fine. It's it's totally uh, about, you know, government uh, false flags and the monetary system being all fucked up and the Fed and all of that and banks being able to uh, essentially create money through fractional reserve banking. And these are all things that I've known for a while. But I guess I started I started watching the second one and I still haven't got to the part where they've got to all this stuff. There's three of them. But I got into listening to some YouTube videos where they got into what their ultimate goal was and what their ultimate goal to summarize it. And we'll get, we'll get into it in detail later in the show. And I, depending on how much time I have to talk about it, I may do an actual show on it because it's, it's insane. And it's also similar to what the UN document, the 2030 document says they just do it in in a different way. So the UN has to be uh, politically correct or it's like the difference between doing a rated R movie and a made for TV. I mean, they have to say things in a certain way and they don't come out and, and, and say exactly the same things, but it's pretty similar. But what the goal of the Venus Project which is, I believe, named after the city that they're, they uh, started it in Venus, Florida. And the Zeitgeist movement is to have a resource-based economy, meaning no currency. Everything would be free, and based on that, everybody would work, too. It, it's, the concept is, is fucking ridiculous, um, but what's scary is that, you know, you get all these people together and whatever, they can't do shit. However, being that a lot of the, their goals are similar to what the UN wants to do, then you start thinking, well, is this something that there's some kind of connection there that this is became a propaganda type movement for the UN and you know maybe it is maybe it isn't who knows what to believe anymore and 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 that's what happens in today's world it's you don't know what the fuck to believe um you know some things you can validate and verify and 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 make sense but you know, when it comes to things like that, you know, is there a connection between the two? And I'd have to do more research into that. But um, my point is, is that we'll be talking about that as well. And I think it's, it's very interesting. It, it, it's nuts. But I think it's something that's important for people to know about. So 
um, essentially we'll be talking about those three uh, different things and getting into some detail on them. Um, so we won't just be focusing 100% on free markets and the current uh, state of things. We'll also be talking about this zeitgeist. Well, really, it's it's if you want to get technical, it's a resource-based uh, economy. And they even got an a- acronym. They call it um, RBE. I can't believe they were calling it RBE. I'm like, oh my god, you guys are, and you guys are nuts. And and it seemed like, and I'll get into this later. But the first Zeitgeist movie, you would think it was like a libertarian movie, to be honest, and that they tried to suck people in that didn't know about fractional reserve banking and didn't know about the Fed and the monetary system, and they sucked them in to, oh, this is the best way to uh, fix things, where really you don't have to get rid of any you know monetary system. They, people used to just trade things. They're not even for that. That kind of proves it right there that there's something uh, weird going on because they're against, like, say you have a pair of shoes and I have a jacket, and, you know, I believe that your pair of shoes are worth more to me than my jacket is, and you vice versa. You know, the jacket's worth more to you than the pair of shoes. So we trade, which is essentially what money is. Really, it's just supposed to represent, it was supposed to represent gold because gold was supposed to back it up, but it was supposed to take the place of gold so you wouldn't have to carry around a bunch of gold. And really, you're just, you know, trading that and then you could redeem your gold at any time. So it was really just to take the place of, um, you know, not everybody had something to offer or whatever, so they get paid in, in instead of gold, they get paid in dollars and they could actually, literally, this is true, you could return your dollars for gold pieces. So I think personally that we should go back to the gold standard that if we have to use literal gold and or silver that we should use that um, because the monetary system as it is now is fucked up. Now, monetary systems in general or not an issue. I don't think there's anything wrong with, I think you need a monetary system. I think you need a system of exchange. I mean, it's just you, whether you fucking exchange uh, goods for goods or whatever, but you need some form of exchange. And the best way to do that is to have something uh, that you can carry around that represents something else. Now, right now we have fiat currency and that's a problem. So the whole monetary system in the U S is fucked up in the whole world. It is, but we need to get back to a gold back system or carry around fucking gold if we have to, um, if they can't get to, we can't trust the government, obviously. Um, so just to summarize what we're going to go through and then, uh, we'll get to each one in detail. So we're going to talk about the current economy, which is, all fucked up. I mean, it, it, to me, it's a mixture of it's, there's a little capitalism in there. There's some socialism in there. You have a government monopoly on so many things like police and uh, garbage pickup in most places, um, a variety of firemen, a, a, a variety of things, which if it was in the free market, you'd pay to obtain those services from a private company. And again, and I've done this a whole bunch of times, but private and outsource is different. 
So remember that outsourcing means that the government is taking your tax money and paying it to somebody to do something like they do with prisons. They're not private prisons. They're outsourced prisons. They pay tax money to the prison. And there's pretty much nothing that's private. Um, There are some towns that the garbage is private where you can hire your own garbage company and the government has nothing to do with it. Private means the government is out of it. You go and hire whatever. So like clothes are private, supermarket, food, well, sort of, because they get involved in farming and all of that, subsidies and shit like that. But, um, you know, and they regulate all this shit. So it's not uh, outside of the realm of the government, but in reality it is private as far as you know tax money doesn't go towards it so if you 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 know people start their own businesses they start a clothes store or whatever and it it's private it's you go and buy clothes from the person who owns the store or you go and buy food from the person who owns the store who buys you know food from maybe farmers that it, that the government is too heavily involved with but still so those are private. Um, again, outsourced is when, in terms of government, is when they take your tax money and instead of them being government employees, they're employees of another company. Like they do with the NSA, like Edward Snowden worked for uh, Booz Allen. Booz Allen wasn't private. I mean, they're a private company. But that contract wasn't private. It was tax money they outsourced to a private company. So the company is private. The exchange when it comes to that is not private. So the same with private prisons. They're, the prisons themselves aren't private because essentially they're owned. Well, I guess they're owned by the company, but the com- it's more the company's private and they outsource the government outsources the functions of the prison to that company but it's tax money going towards it same with with Booz Allen it's tax money they're paying them to do a job instead of going out and hiring a bunch of people and paying them directly so and and regular corporations do that too that outsource payroll so what they do they'll do is they'll hire a payroll company they'll give the pay the payroll com- company to do the payroll for the corporation that's outsourcing that's not private it's a private company that you outsource to so anyway uh we'll talk about the current economy the government monopolies corporatism which is really what we have corporatism and crony capitalism with a mixture of kind of capitalism and socialism and fascism. Um, It's controlled by corporations and government, the economy. Um, And, of course, we have the Federal Reserve. We have fractional reserve banking. I'll get into details on all these things. I'm just giving a summary of what we're going to talk about. Uh, And then you have Venture... Venture... (laughs) <laughs> venture capitalists that have unlimited amounts of money as well as uh the investment side of banks that had a, they have unlimited amounts of money because of the federal reserve to do things like buy up all we were talking about all these houses being bought up in Las Vegas and they can outbid anybody because they have unlimited amounts of money So we'll talk all about that. We'll talk about the free market economy, the true free market economy, and talk about true freedom and voluntarism, which I believe is the only true uh, freedom-based economy, uh, voluntary exchange of goods, whether it's based on a currency or trade or whatever. uh, That's up to the two people making that trade. And pretty much that's illegal for the most part unless you know you're doing it privately with somebody else or 
at a swap meet or gun show or something like that. And then we'll talk about the socialist uh, Venus Project, who uh, the the guy who made the Zeitgeist movies, who kind of started this movement, tried to say they're not socialist. Uh, yeah, right. Um, it's obvious in what they're trying to do that they're socialist. And we'll also talk about a little about the UN and how it's kind of similar to what the uh, Venus Project and Zeitgeist Movement is is trying to do. Basically, just two names for the same thing. So, with the current economy, um, as many people know, you have, of course, all of these corporations that give money to politicians that expects that expect favors in return. And most of them get those favors in return. A lot have to do with regulations. What happens is once once a corporation becomes big enough, regulations help them in a way because each industry has what they call barriers to entry. So when it comes to the Internet, the barriers to entry are very low. It's easy for anybody, like I can start a radio show and what do I need? Like, you know, a computer, a microphone and, you know, 50 bucks or something. Actually, you don't even need to, um, you, if you did a half hour show or whatever and didn't want all the uh, bells and whistles or whatever, you could do a free half hour show if you really wanted to. So the barrier t- to entry when it comes to the internet or internet businesses, even if it's uh, a website where you sell stuff, are very low. Although I believe for stuff like that, that you're supposed to get a business license and shit, but I, I don't even know if they'd find out, to be honest. Um, so I'm not sure with if you have an actual internet business because you're supposed to be filing taxes in the state that you live in. Um, only in that state you have to collect taxes from people that live in that state, and that's it. Um, but the barriers to entry are, are very small compared to other businesses. Like if you wanted to get involved, and I always use this as an example, in the department store business and compete with companies like Walmart. you know. And I think things like the restaurant business, although I think it's getting a lot harder because there's so many corporations and restaurant chains that are coming out um fast food too it it's probably very hard because how many private uh or local fast food joints do you know of probably not a lot there are uh restaurants here and there and definitely bars um you see a lot of bars that are only in one city and maybe even only one bar, but even the bar business I see, at least in Las Vegas, uh, they are corporate. So you have more and more companies that are becoming uh, corporations that are benefiting from, or they're already in, you know, the industry and been in the industry and they're they're making it harder for other businesses to get into that same industry and the barriers to entry are getting more complicated and again part of that is because what happens is once these companies get you know you have companies that kind of control an industry and i always go to walmart because it's just an easy example that they want regulations because what regulations do is it keeps other small businesses from getting into the industry. So the more regulations there are, they can afford them. They can do all that shit. They don't give a fuck. Even things like I've talked about before with, you know, minimum wage, you hire minimum wage, Walmart really doesn't give a fuck. They might act like they do, but in the long long term, it benefits them because they get business from a bunch of places that are going to close. 
So a lot of these regulations they want because it ups the barriers to entry. It makes it harder for there to be any competition. And you're going to get to a point, you know, look at the media. It's like, you know, five or six companies that run all media. And I'm talking about TV, radio, newspaper, magazine, any type of media you can think of, even search engines on the internet. So you're uh, getting to a totally it's almost the opposite of fascism because fascism is where the government controls all the corporations. It's almost like the corporations control the government. Now they don't, but they allow them to. So I mean that in the sense that the corporations, you know, give money to all the politicians, they buy politicians. And then the other thing that they do, it's a revolving door. If you notice Look, like, look at the new cabinet that uh, President Fuckhead, you know, picked. And even Obama and Bush and whoever. You look at a lot of these guys and they're all, it's like a revolving door from the private sector to, from big corporations in the private sector, especially banking, to uh, government. So they have the same interests. And then you have groups like the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations, and the Trilateral Commission, and supposedly the Bilderberg Group, these groups that run the world. But these groups that have people meeting about policy, and none of them are in government. Some of them were in government at one point, but they're not in government now. So it's like, okay, what the fuck is going on here? And a lot of people don't even know that. They may think the CFR is part of the government. Because I remember hearing, you know, before the election, Hillary did some speech in front of them. Like, why would you even go there? Who the fuck are they? Now, I know who they are as far as, like, they're all the elites and people that run companies former uh, governors, congressmen, even presidents. Um, So, or presidents were at one time um, part of some of these groups. So that's why. And it's like they're making policy or suggesting policy to these advisors and they're not even part of government. It's, It's pretty fucked up. So there's um, basically what I would call corporatism right now where, you know, corporations pretty much run the majority of things and, and get away with them. And we're getting to a point where, the times of the small businesses and whatever are being run out of business where it's going to be, you know, and it's funny because if you watch a lot of these movies from years ago and they were supposed to be in the future, you know, everything was a corporation, you know, these big corporations ran everything. And that's pretty much how it's getting now where big corporations they buy all these other companies and they control, you know, not just one industry, but multiple industries. And, you know, if you're talking about office furniture, I mean, it's not a big deal. And the reason I bring that up is because years ago, maybe like 10 years ago now, the, um, uh, whoever approves, I forget their name, but whoever approves mergers of companies, it was like Office Depot and Office Max were going to merge. And they took all this time okaying it. But when Viacom and CV- CBS merged, they approved it right away. Now, which is more important? Two huge media conglomerates merging that are companies that control the flow of information out to the public 
or two fucking office furniture places. I mean, don't get me wrong. It it matters, but I mean, you know, office furniture compared to two of the biggest media companies in the country, which is more important? Obviously, the two biggest media companies in the country, and, of course, they merged. And, and when I was in college, um, undergrad, I had to take a class. I've told this story once before, but um, and I still have the book, so I should look in the – I actually just came across it uh, last week because it's in my closet. But at the time, I think it was either eight to ten companies. And this was – I don't want to say when it was, but – uh, we'll say it was in excess of 10 years ago. So what the book was about was about how all these media companies were merging and nobody said shit because why is it going to be, why is the media going to cover it? Of course they're not. There was a thing that they did uh, Saturday night live did a skit on it. They never showed it again. It was like banned because they don't want anybody messing with, even if you're not uh, one of the companies that were merging or if you're a different station not affiliated with NBC, which is what where Saturday Night Live is on, they didn't want anybody to think about it or see it again. And they didn't. So meaning that, you know, they don't want people to think about these things, that the that the majority of information is controlled. But at that time, I think it was 10 or like it was it was either 10 that controlled like 95 percent or it was eight that controlled a little less percentage wise, like maybe 80 percent. It was like eight that controlled 80 percent or something. Now, I think it's like six that controls like 99 percent. And they talked about all the newspaper, like, because people think, oh, it's just TV. No, it's not just TV. It's every type of information possible. And it even affects the Internet, unfortunately. But luckily, they can only affect it to a certain extent because it's search engines, really, that they control. Now, they do buy up a lot of websites when they become big. They'll buy them up. But at the same time... You know, you can't, there's so many websites, there's so many people that are putting websites out there. Um, That's really the only place that there's some kind of freedom, but they can, they own a lot uh, when it comes to the internet as well, that these companies are affiliated, like AOL was affiliated with Time Warner. I don't know if they still own AOL, but if anybody cares about AOL anymore, And um, somebody I thought bought Yahoo, but or at least uh, put in a bid. And then you had, um, I think Bing is owned by NBC or you had uh, MSN that was NBC and somebody else. I think it might have been Fox, actually, that. uh, But, of course, they hate each other, right? That, um, you know it was a joint venture. So it's not just TV and it's cable too. Um, I think time Warner owns HBO and Showtime. It's so many, you know, so essentially you're going to get to a point where the majority of industries are owned by huge corporations And that affects things in a whole bunch of different ways. So it affects things how? Well, one, you look at getting a job. And I suggest if you can work for a small business where the owner, because some of these owners are nuts, but (laughs) the owner is a nice guy, stay with small businesses. The corporate world is just, it sucks. It really does fucking suck. It's all political. It's all bullshit. I mean, the fucking government's a corporation. So uh, what's the difference, really? Um, 
And the other thing is, is if you work for one corporation, but they also own 20 other corporations, and I ran into this with casinos. I mean, there's like three or four companies that own 95% of the casinos. So when I applied for a job with a casino, I'm like, well, now I can't apply for, you know, this whole list, basically. I mean, I can, but it's like, why bother? Because I'm dealing with the same HR people. So it's like you can get blacklisted from working at one place because they own all these other places. So it makes getting a job harder. And it's like the difference between, you know, doctors or something like a doctor that, you know, and this is maybe a bad analogy, but gives you a lot of attention and is a good doctor and talks to you about stuff. And, and then the, you know, what it's turned to now for most doctors is just the in and out, you know, let me see as many patients as I can and whatever. And that's kind of how it is. It's getting more and more like that because everything's, you know, corporate. Now, the only positive thing I see about corporations is that they're legally held to a higher standard um, they worry a lot about lawsuits. So they go through, if they fire you, they usually go through a whole uh, set of procedures and HR gets very involved in that and they won't just fire you for no reason or something like that. Um, but they can... What they can do is, I mean, if they really want to get rid of you, they can. They, and they can fuck with you and make your life, uh, you know, miserable if they want to and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I mean, everything's becoming corporate. And that's a, that's a bad thing. Um, because what it does is, instead of being able to start your own business you're stuck in this world of corporations where the barrier to entries are just so hard, you know, depending on the business, there's still a couple businesses that, you know, and definitely the internet, like I said, I mean, that's, if you want to start your own internet business and that's really what you want to do, um, that's doable. That's something that I don't think you're going to have a problem with. Now, you might have a problem being successful, but I mean, as far as being able to start it, um, I, I don't see you having a problem with. But besides the internet, you can't compete with these other companies because they're just too big. They literally are. So you have that. And, and not only that is they're backed by the government. And that's even worse. So they have all these deals with the government. It's like there's nothing you can really do. If it comes in, if something happened where they wanted to get you out of business or whatever, or you were taking part of their market share, um, you know, who knows what the government would do to help them. And I'm just using the word government as a catch all, but you know, they buy certain Congress people or, you know, some people buy the president, <laughs> um, you know, and contribute a lot to their campaign. So, so you have that. Um, the, the other thing is that you have all these laws that the government has created that protects corporations, LLCs, and stuff like that. Now, this wouldn't be the case in a in a free market because what it does is it it protects them from liability. If you have a corporation or LLC, they can't go after your personal assets. So if your if your company declares bankruptcy and you don't have enough money to pay your creditors or whatever, or you just want to run your business into the ground and suck as much money out of it as you can, you can probably do that, and they can't go after your personal assets. But that is a government creation. 
So without government, corporations don't exist. And that's a huge thing. And when we get to um, the free market, we'll get more into that. So the other thing that's happening, of course, is you have government monopolies as well. As I was mentioning earlier, the police, so protection services, firefighters, usually garbage men, the post office, even though I know you have FedEx and UPS, but there is a law that only the post office can deliver mail. Now, I don't know how you enforce that because you could put it in a fucking package and how would they know, but it would cost you more money. So it wouldn't make any sense to not use the post office unless you just want to ban all government services, which I pretty much can't remember the last time I sent any mail. So I don't send mail. If I send a check, I, my bank does it. So uh, I pretty much don't use any government services that I can think of. Well, I guess they take my trash, but I got to pay for it. Well, I rent the house, so it gets paid for, put it that way. Um, but there's that, that the government has a monopoly on a bunch of their own businesses. They have a monopoly on force, of course, being the worst thing, and that being the police, the army, all of these things that they have a monopoly on. And there's more. It's just I can't think of any, but nothing comes to mind at the moment. But there's a whole bunch of other uh, things that it shouldn't, they shouldn't have a monopoly on. You know, there's, there's certain things that, okay, if there's a government, I guess I understand why they have a monopoly on this. But they can ch- pick and choose what they have a monopoly on. They're the government. They can do whatever the fuck they want to do. So uh, it's it's crazy. But um, what it's doing, though, is and, and this is where when I talk about them, I agree with them on a certain amount of things in a way is they're. I always talk about how the government's building an infrastructure, meaning they're arming the police to the teeth uh, with tanks and with automatic weapons. They put up their whole spy grid, you know, where they have the data center in Utah and who knows where else, and they're collecting all your data and how people cannot be, you know, upset about this and just, go through their daily life like it's not a big deal i i just i can't fathom the whole thing um but anyway so they're setting up all this infrastructure and other things that we don't even know about but um those are some of the things there's other stuff um that i'm aware of as well um that just don't come to mind right now but they're setting up all this infrastructure. And I think another thing that they want to do is they want corporations to be running everything. They don't want any small businesses. That way it gives corporations more control over your life as well. And government has a relationship with corporations like that. So they are able to an extent to control you that way as well. It's like, you're stuck working for the man and there's no other options and you can't start your own business and you can't work for a small business or, um, you know, you have to work for a corporation. And then if you piss this corporation off, well, they own 20 other corporations. So you have that. So when it comes to, Well, actually, we'll take a quick break, and when we get back, we'll get to the monetary um, system um, and talk about that as well as um, markets because that's actually a big part of this whole entire thing, probably the biggest uh, part of currently what they're doing now 
what would change in free markets and the so-called rationale or reason why the zeitgeist people want to uh, implement their ideas, so they say. So we'll take a quick break um, when we get back. Like I said, we'll talk more about the setup of the monetary system in the U.S., a little history, not much, um, and how it currently works. And for people that don't know, and a lot of people actually don't know, and because they don't teach you in school, they don't really uh, talk about it because it's not something, you know, there's a lot of things that the government does that they're not secret, they're public information, but they don't want to just come out and talk about it. Like you'll never hear it in the media. You'll never uh, hear it in school. They're not going to come out and talk about it if they don't have to. I mean, you can find out about it. You can read books about it, but they're not going to just, you know, uh, talk about it if they don't have to. So, so we'll be right back after this. I'll actually play a clip from the uh, zeitgeist um, venus project to kind of get you ready uh, for that Um, and the resource-based economy which is beyond scary Um, like i said if it wasn't a un kind of back thing not that they're coming out saying they're backing it but the UN doing something similar in their uh, literature and documents that they're releasing. I would just look at these people like I look at the alt-right, like they're just a bunch of nuts. Um, But when you have all these countries that are trying to do a similar thing, it gives it some validity. So we'll play this and be right back. Be sure to check us out at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. And if you're a fan of the show and you listen live, please feel free to either call in or Skype in. You know, tell me your thoughts. Or um, if you're nervous and don't like being on the air, there's a chat room where you could type a question and I could address your question there. Or you could email me as well. So, uh, don't be a stranger, <laughs> you know, uh, get involved in the conversation, you know, bring up points that I forgot to bring up or questions that you may have or, or whatever. So we'll be right back after this nonpartisan liberty for all dot com. Check us out. Now, Peter Joseph of the Zeitgeist Movement has never called for violence or coercion, and I've never accused him of calling for violence and coercion. However, if his followers ever get the chance to put the philosophy that he advocates into action, it will lead to violence. Now, in order to understand why, you have to take a good, hard, honest look at property rights. Now, the obvious problem which arises when you look at their prescription, which calls for 100% control of the world's resources, is that those resources are on land, and that land is owned by people. Now, the underlying question, which should be very obvious, I keep proposing to people in the comment section, what do you do to the people who don't want to actually give up their property, whether that property is land, factories, or any other kind of infrastructure? Now, most of the people try to skirt around the issue, but I got a couple comments that were actually pretty honest. Now, this comment was posted by Evil Genius 747 and he answers, what about the people who want to keep the land for themselves? And in big capital letters, he writes, The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Now, I'm going to gloss over the fact that this is a quote from a science fiction series, and I'm going to jump right into the implications of what this guy is actually saying. Now, what you're making really clear here is that you don't care about property rights, and that if you want something, you're going to come and take it, because you're with the many, and I'm with the few, and you got needs. Now, if you really can't see how this would lead to violence, then maybe you should come to Texas and give it a little trial run. And there was another comment posted by World Watch 100, which makes it ever so clear what's at stake here. And he writes, Unfortunately, people like you will be forced to participate in the resource-based economy the same way that billions of people are forced to participate in a deadly monetary system. All right, now that we got it out in the open, how? How are you going to force me to comply? You guys are going to face armed resistance. 
So are you going to build an army? Do you have the guts to pull the trigger? Because that's what it's going to take. And you do realize if it comes to that, then your whole idea of being a nonviolent voluntary society is out the window. You will have just created a violent totalitarian dictatorship of epic proportions. Now, it seems to me that you guys have the impression that this is going to have a better outcome if it all goes down after rule of law is gone. And I actually have a comment here that was posted on a video which pretty clearly illustrates that perspective. And this was posted by World at Large 77. And he says, you obviously don't get the point of the documentary. If people don't give up their ideas of ownership and don't feel like converting to a more singular and community-based world, your opinion won't even exist because you'll be dead. This species is doing a pretty shitty job of maintaining its future. Now, the fact that you would say something like this in itself is pretty revealing. But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and just deal with your argument at face value. Now, where on earth did you get the idea that you and the Zeitgeist followers are somehow going to survive this cataclysm that's heading our way while people like me who believe in personal liberty and property rights would just be dead. You see, I own farmland. I have heirloom seeds. I've worked on farms. I was raised hunting and fishing. I know how to recognize edible plants. And I have the means and the will to defend my property and my family if it ever comes to that. And I hope it doesn't. So what about you? How prepared are you for what's coming? I get the impression, based on your comments, that you guys aren't preparing at all. I also get the impression that you wouldn't know how to find or produce food for yourselves in a natural environment. By my calculations, the people who think like me, who take responsibility for their livelihood, are much more likely to survive. The way I see it, if you see this disaster coming, and you're doing nothing to get ready for it, then that's just irresponsible. And if you think you're going to get by by just taking from other people what they've accumulated during this time that they're preparing, then that's criminal. The thing is, a scenario like that will lead to violence, whether you say you want violence or not. And if it's you that's walking onto someone's land with the intention of taking it, then you really don't have much room to complain when you end up getting shot. And really, I'm doing you guys a favor by telling you this, because that's how it would end. You may not care about property rights, but you're not the one with the property. Now, there's a pretty common response that people keep coming back to me with in the personal messages and the comments. And I have a pretty good example of it right here in this comment that was posted by Colleen FR. And she says, question is, why would you not want to live in a resource-based economy? Then we can continue our conversation. No, 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 no. Someone you don't know walks up to you, asks you for the keys to your car. You say no, and then they demand an explanation? Quite frankly, I'm astounded that you would think that that's a tenable position. No one should have to justify why they don't want the fruits of their labor taken from them. That should just be common sense. But you know, common sense seems to be pretty lacking in the religion that the zeitgeist movement has become. Now let's just take a second and review the facts at hand and see how we got here. Fact number one, the resource-based economy calls for and requires 100% control of all the world's resources, production, and distribution. And all this would be run by some kind of supercomputer. Fact number two, the infrastructure that you would need to take control of in order to do this is already owned by somebody else. And to get from point A, which is where we are right now, to point B, which would be this total control system, either somehow magically all of us who don't believe in the zeitgeist vision suddenly die off, leaving you guys behind untouched, or you're going to have to take our land. You're going to have to take our factories. You're going to have to take our mines and our farms, our stores, and even our equipment. And if you don't think that that's going to lead to violence, you're in for a very rude awakening. This is a response to the recent video released by the TZM official channel entitled RBE Concepts, Why We Are Not Building Cities. In their video, the TZM official channel spends some time going through a set of justifications for why they're not building cities or communities. I'm going to go through some of these and demonstrate why this position is unscientific and why it breeds distrust for the movement. In part two of the series, they state the following. There's a high chance that there will be scarcity in this scenario, which would not be a good representation of the Venus Project, since the aim of the Venus Project is to consider all the world's resources. As I've said before, the resource-based economy model right now is nothing more than a hypothesis. It has never been tested, and therefore there really is no proof whatsoever that it would work on any scale, much less a global scale. What you're proposing by insisting that we try this on a global level first is nothing short of taking an experimental medication and distributing it to the public at large without so much as seeing what it does to rats. That's not scientific, and it's dangerous. If you fail on a global scale, then the consequences will be global. Furthermore, it seems to me that the movement is more concerned about the damage to its image which may result from having a test case fail than it is in actually finding out what would actually work. Failure is a part of science. You should embrace it. It should be a clearly stated position of your movement that it will most assuredly fail in the first several attempts. Do you really think that Edison would have invented the light bulb if he had insisted on never making an attempt that went awry? Failure is how science discovers what doesn't work. And when you know one thing that doesn't work, you're that much closer to discovering an approach that will. I've heard the argument made that you guys need enough of the right kind of people thinking in the right way in order for the resource-based economy to work. 
But at the same time, you assert this, this resource-based economy, which will fix the fundamental human problems, which would normally keep the resource-based economy from working. That sounds like circular logic to me. Any solution that's going to change the direction of society has to start with humans as they are right now. And quite frankly, if your solution doesn't handle people in their current state, then it's really not a solution at all. Now, I'm familiar with the typical rebuttals that technology is going to fix all this. But from my experience, having lived in communes and intentional communities, what makes or breaks a community is the human element. It's the decision-making process, the dispute resolution process, the rules and bylaws and how they're implemented. This is difficult stuff, and if you as a movement aren't able to demonstrate that you've mastered these principles in small groups in long-term living situations, then people like me who've actually participated in that kind of living environment are going to be very skeptical that you're capable of pulling it off. You need to remember that the burden of proof falls squarely on your shoulders. Those of us who are looking at this from the outside are not impressed with mock-ups or theoretical solutions. We want to see proof. And a lot of people are going to be a lot less polite than me if you don't provide it. This is a video response and a challenge to Peter Joseph based on his reply to Stefan Molyneux. Both videos will be linked below, and any and all video responses will be accepted. Now, as I was listening to both sides of this debate, I was first allowing myself to be drawn into the details of each position. But then I took a step back, and I looked at it, and I realized that the key is not in what's being said, but rather in what's being left out. Peter Joseph's argument is delivered as a multiple choice question. Either A, you support the current system and the paradigm which created it, or B, we move to his resource-based economy with everything that comes with it, including a computerized control grid which will dictate how every square inch of land and resource is utilized. Now this is a clear example of a false dichotomy, also known as the false dilemma logical fallacy. It should be obvious to everyone that there's more than two choices. Now just because you haven't heard someone propose the choice that you like, is irrelevant. It is still intellectually dishonest and in fact dangerous to pretend that you have the one and only way. Now, we both agree that the current system is doomed, so let's not waste time defending a dead horse or accusing me of defending it. This system will most likely collapse in our lifetime. What's at stake is what will grow up or be instituted to replace the current system. My position is this. The system that you propose would not only fall short of the promises that it offers for those that are desperate for hope, but would in fact lead to an even darker and more oppressive system than the one we have right now and I'm going to explain why. Before I do, I'm going to play a short clip just so we're clear where we're starting from. You know, you can always uh, tell when someone's nervous about a particular subject by the way they color their responses, especially if they present ego and they start to use sarcasm, and uh, it's a very revealing thing to show the insecurity of the individual. All right, those are your words. Now let's apply them to the following clip taken two hours and 12 minutes into the new Zeitgeist film. When we consider a resource-based economy, there are often a number of arguments that tend to come up with regard hey, to the efficiency. Hey, uh, hey, uh, now hold on just a minute. Yes. I know what this is. This is called Marxism, buddy. Stalin killed 800 billion people because of ideas like this. You got a lot of dark. This is just nonsense. Hold on, hold on. Communist, fascist. You don't like America, you should just leave. Right, everybody you know just calm down. Stick to the new world order. Stick to the new world order. And as the irrationality of the audience grew, shocked and confused, suddenly the narrator suffered a fatal heart attack. And the seemingly communist propaganda film was no more. Now, if you watch this film, consider the context. And take a second to ask yourself, what's hiding behind Peter's sarcasm in this scene? He's resorting to mockery, and he's using it to avoid a very important question. Control. In this future world that you claim is inevitable, all resources, all production, every square inch of what we currently think of as property would be controlled by a supercomputer. But who programs that computer? And who decides how that computer is programmed? Those people, whether you're willing to name them or not, will in fact be the ones who decide how resources are used. They will have the power of life and death over every person on this planet. And I know you hold out the hope that humans will evolve to a point where they can be trusted with such power. However, we can't count on what people may theoretically become someday. We have to deal with humans as they are right now. And right now, there's a certain percentage of humans that are drawn to power and will grab it if the chance arises. Now I can Partisan liberty for all. That's actually Tony's theme from Scarface. <laughs> He's at the end there. Um, so we'll talk about that stuff later in the show and get into it in a little more detail regarding the Zeitgeist movies 
and how, you know, uh, uh, people have been talking about them for a while because the first one came out in 2008. And that was, could have easily been taken as a libertarian type movie. I think Ron Paul was even in it. Now, I don't know if that was just an interview that he got permission to put in there or if he interviewed Ron Paul. I don't remember. And I saw most of the second one, although I fell asleep watching it. Um, the third one, I haven't seen him get into how they were going to do this. And it, and it actually took a long time to find people that would sit down and explain how a resource-based economy would work. So I, I did a lot of research trying to find out. And then finally, I got people to talk about it. Oh, I didn't get them to talk about it. I found people that were talking about it, but it makes no fucking sense. It's 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 like you know a I guess it sounds it it doesn't sound good on paper neither. I was gonna say I guess it sounds good in theory. It might sound good in theory to them, but there's only one way it would work and I'll go into how, I mean, and it wouldn't work, but I mean, there's only one way they could do it and they'd have to have the government force people to do it first of all. So there's no way, and that's kind of what he was saying. There's no way it could be done um, peacefully. It's basically similar to something that, uh, Anarch socialist anarchists want to do, but say they want to do it without the government in a way, but it's not possible unless, you know, they did all the violence and theft themselves. But anyway, we'll get to that later in the show. So um, back to the current economy. So I want to go through the banking system what they call the monetary system and a couple other things before we move on to a free market economy and how I, I see that. Um, basically how I see a free market economy in terms of the only way you could actually have freedom in, a, in an, an economy, true freedom. So... Had to use my cough button there. Um, so let's start with, for the people that don't know, uh, go through the history very briefly, that in 1913 they passed the Federal Reserve Act. I, I always get it confused, One that and the income tax uh, amendment, which really did not do anything to add any additional taxes on income only in foreign income and they did it back then i guess th whoever was there would vote you wouldn't have to have a certain amount of people which is insane but i forget which one was done on new year's and which one was done like around christmas uh, but in 1913 they started the federal reserve and i believe it was either in the same year or the year after there was the income tax bill. So they wanted people, even though it actually didn't say that, they wanted people to pay taxes anyway from their income, which they ended up doing, uh, at least most of them. And there's no coincidence that that's what they, that those two kind of go together. So the billionaires could actually get tax money. So, and I, it'd be funny to see, not funny, that kind of funny, but look at the budgets from 19, say, 14 all the way until, well, you had World War One. So to maybe look at the budgets from after World War One to World War Two, um, and how much tax revenue they were pulling in and compared to prior to 1913 
to see, you know, all this extra money now coming in and what was it being used for? Now, during the war, obviously, it was being used for that. And I know they gave money to England was the first thing they did uh, to pay J.P. Morgan that England could no longer pay their loan to J.P. Morgan. Supposedly, that's why the United States got into the war, according to G. Edward Griffin's book, uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Now, I know it is a fact that they immediately, when they entered the war, lent money to England, which England used to pay J.P. Morgan. Not all of it, I'm assuming, but, you know, whatever they owed for that. I don't know how they... uh, negotiate loans with governments or whatever but some of that money went to jp morgan who they got a loan for to finance the war so anyway that had passed so that created a central bank now initially the bank was backed by gold in the 1930s i believe so each piece of gold was worth they valued it at twenty dollars and which is kind of fucked up if you think about it because if we were still on the gold standard you could turn in uh twenty dollars well they actually raised it later but it was but you couldn't get what they raised it to so you could get twenty dollars so you could turn in was it a dollar for one ounce or 20 actual dollars. I can't remember, but let's say it was $20 for $20. So an ounce of gold, say it was $20. So you could get $20, even though right now gold is worth $1,100. So how would that even work? Uh, I don't know, but it was backed by gold in the thirties. Roosevelt, in order to create more money, upped it to, I believe 35 And at that time, they confiscated everybody's gold. Now, from what I understand from Ken Shorjan, our our historian, um, that they didn't go and check him out at uh, dailyeconomist.com and his show on uh, YouTube on the Ken Shorjan channel. But that uh, Ken had said that what they did was they upped it to $35. However, they only gave you $20 for each ounce of gold. And if you wanted to turn money in later, they still only gave you $20. But they confiscated everyone's gold, but they didn't go like house to house, ripping your house apart, looking for gold. It was more a voluntary type on a voluntary basis. And you couldn't sell gold uh, with the exception of jewelry, from what I understand, like gold coins or anything like that, until after they got off the gold standard, I believe. I believe it wasn't until sometime in the 70s. So in 1971, because they couldn't afford the war in Vietnam, they got off the gold standard. Now, there's so many things throughout U.S. history And I was really good in history. It's just they didn't get into shit like this. The shit that they didn't want you to really know about that. Yeah, if you did research, you could find out more about it. But they weren't going to volunteer it, like I was saying earlier. But whether Nixon, I, I don't think that was something that he would come up with on his own, essentially. That this was you know, a powers that be thing. And really, if it wasn't for OPEC, I think the United States would have been in a lot of trouble from what I understand. So what happened was, and again, this is all my understanding of it. And I'm not a historian, but uh, a lot of it was in talking to Ken, who does have a degree in history and is an expert in history. Um, and who's on the show every other uh, Wednesday. So be sure to tune in uh, next Wednesday for Ken. But tune in tomorrow as well. (laughs) Tune in every Wednesday, but every other Wednesday, uh, Ken will be on to talk about geopolitics and the economy. But 
before that, after World War II, Europe was totally fucking destroyed. And of course, Europe being the countries in Europe being the richest countries in the world. And they had owed the U.S. a lot of money, so they gave them a lot of gold. And it put the U.S. in a really good position because they weren't attacked besides, you know, Pearl Harbor, which wasn't even a state at the time, Hawaii. Um, I don't think it became a state until 1949. So it did a little while after. But, I mean, the damages, you know, wasn't anything compared to what happened in, within Europe. So, you know, they had fought in the war, but they got money from all these countries that they helped out. That's when they really became a superpower because the U.S. dollar was named the reserve currency. They had all the gold to back it up. And the other countries were told that, yes, if you want to redeem your cash for gold, you can always do that. What the res- being the reserve currency is, means is that when one country, you know, say, I mean, they're in the euro, so it wouldn't apply. But say back then, before the euro, Spain trades with England. They would trade in U.S. dollars. Now, I don't know with England that because of it being uh, a superpower, although it just got destroyed, um, that later that they wouldn't take uh, British pounds. But that was the idea, that everybody would trade between countries in U.S. dollars. And they created the SWIFT system, which essentially was the exchange system, but you'd have to pay a fee. Just like now, if you exchange, you go to another country and exchange dollars for their currency, you have to pay a fee. Um, an exchange rate like, you know, 2% or whatever, 3%, something like that. So what they, I think most countries will take U.S. dollars. Um, so all of these countries had to keep, and they still do, U.S. dollars on hand, which, of course, inflated the um, value of the dollar was high. And it was backed by gold. Now, at the time, it was $35 an ounce. Supposedly, all the gold was in Fort Knox. Where the gold is now and what happened to all the gold, we have no idea. I had brought up on last last week's show with Ken about France asking for their gold, and they never got their gold back. And there's a lot of contracts being sold. What happens is... They sell gold future contracts. So you're going to, whatever the price is, you get locked in. So say the price is $1,100. I don't know exactly what it is right this minute, but it was around, when I checked a few days ago or last week, it was like 1160 or 30 something like that. But say it's 1130 So you lock in your price now because you think it's going to go up. So what what's going to happen is usually they don't actually get delivery of the gold but say they set it up the contract for and i don't know a lot about this uh but i don't know what the usual time range is but let's say a year so they got to deliver the gold in a year but say the price goes up between now and then two hundred dollars and they buy you know five million dollars worth of gold they can either take the gold, they can take the money, or I think they can roll it over into another contract. So I think most of the time they end up taking the money because they're just investing in the in in the currency. Uh, not the currency, but in the gold. So supposedly a lot of these contracts, they're selling false contracts. They don't have gold. So that's why I'd advise anybody, I mean... Most people that buy contracts, it's more big banks and companies and, you know, some money that's buying a couple thousand dollars. I don't think they buy a contract or something. So 
I would suggest anybody who has anything to do with gold or wants gold uh, personally um, to buy the actual gold and store it yourself because you never know. Um, but I don't know that they sell to, you know, there's probably a minimum amount and it might be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I, I don't know. So, but anyway, going back, so up until I believe it was 1971, it was around there during the Vietnam War. So Nixon, and again, I believe this is what he was told to do, uh, took the dollar off the gold standard, which means it was a fucking piece of paper. It was meaningless, although it was still the reserve currency and they still had to use it. Now, what ended up happening, and I don't know the details of how this ended up happening, but all the countries that were part of OPEC, which is Saudi Arabia, I think Jordan, um, is it Omar? Is that the name of the, um, or Omen, something like that? Yemen was one of them. Um, Iraq. There were a number of countries. They were the biggest, I think it was actually at the time, the biggest group of oil producing countries. So what happened was they made a deal in which if you bought oil from OPEC, you had to buy it in U.S. dollars. So they had two things. They had it was still the reserve currency, even though they didn't have the gold to back it. And it was the currency that the majority of oil was purchased in. So I don't know what would have happened. Um, Ken would have a better idea if they didn't make a deal with OPEC. Because to me, it's almost like, you know, it's called a petrodollar. It's almost like oil took the place of gold. It didn't, but it did. It, 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 so... It's not like they have oil and this oil backs the dollar directly. But in in other words, it's kind of like it does. It doesn't officially the same way gold did that you have for each uh you know dollar you should have the gold to back it. It wasn't like for each you know, dollar that they had the the oil to back it and they keep track of how much oil. They, it wasn't anything like that, but it helped maintain the value, even though the value of the dollar, if you look at from, uh, I just looked at a chart recently, you know, how much the value of the dollar has went down in the past, what, 100 years. I mean, it's ridiculous, but it seems like that's what's kind of saved the dollar. Now, I could be wrong. Um, so now it's backed by nothing. And it's just really a piece of paper. Now, what gives it its power is really the people. They still have OPEC, so you still have to buy money in OPEC. But what happens is all these other countries are starting to sell oil and they're not selling it in U.S. dollars. And that's why they're trying to attack them or overthrow their governments. And they've done it um, in a whole bunch of countries. And we're not going to get into that today. But it, there's a lot of stuff that went on, covert ops with the CIA. And they basically have built their own empire. And I think this was even in the Zeitgeist movies um if not it was in something else but the uh confessions of an economic hitman who was a guy who would try to first buy off a dictator or a leader of a country if that didn't work they'd send in the CIA to try to get rid of him and if that didn't work uh they'd send in the military and go to war so they did it in a way that it didn't look like to the American people, they were doing anything wrong, at least for the ignorant. Um, and at the time, I wouldn't even call them ignorant. I mean, since the Internet, 
we've all had the benefit of finding a lot of things out, even government documents that we would have to actually go to Washington, D.C. or to the National Archives or wherever to get a lot of this information and we can get it, you know, just by fucking sitting at our computer. So um, there's, you can't really, I I can't really blame people um, at that time. But, and of course the CIA backed Castro and helped him overthrow the government over there. Um, We had talked about that last week. So anyway, that's why some of the inflation is not hitting us because the majority of U.S. dollars is not even in the U.S. It's in other countries. So they're getting hit with inflation, although now supposedly the U.S. dollar is at like some all-time high in I don't know how many years, the value of the dollar. But it's still, you know, to me, it has no value. And the criteria for a currency, um, Ken had went through this on one of the shows. It has to be fungible. Um, and I forget exactly all the things that go into that. And it has to be, I mean, what gives it its power is, is two things, I believe. is One is the government forces you to use it. You have to accept dollars if you're an American business. And two, the people believe in it. They believe it's worth something, even though it's really not worth shit. So I believe we need to get back to a currency backed by, first of all, a non-government currency, but something backed by a dollar. A guy got arrested for making his own Liberty dollar. So uh, let's put it that way, um, that you're forced to, of course, use the currency of the government. So what's been happening over the past couple years along with that So you have the Federal Reserve. What is the Federal Reserve supposed to be responsible? It's supposed to control the booms and busts and make sure that that doesn't happen. Of course, they suck at their job. You know, you've had all these market crashes and you've had all uh, the housing market crash in 2008 and all of this stuff. They've been printing, they were printing 80 billion for like two or three years. Now I think they're down to 60 billion. The interest rates have been at zero. They've been at negative, I think, for the banks at one point. Um, They raised them by a half a percent. I'm sorry, a quarter of a percent. You have banks in Japan, I believe, that have negative interest, which means they take your money. I don't know why you'd put your money in the bank. So basically the same things could happen here. There's going to be a crash at some point. We had talked about the housing market last week and housing prices are way up, but everything is controlled. So the stock market is controlled. The housing market is controlled because you have all these companies, venture capitalists that bought up all the houses. So supply and demand, the price is going to go up. They released the foreclose or they foreclosed slowly on houses, so they've slowly released these into the market to keep the price up. They're rigging everything. These uh, banks are putting their money into the stock market instead of giving out loans. So the other thing, and these are all government uh, based policies. So remember that because it makes a difference when we talk about what a um, a free market would, would look like because that would be one of the main things is the currency. But you also have fractional reserve banking. Now, the one thing uh, that's good about credit unions is they only give out what they take in. However, even in that situation, you still don't have enough money to cover everything. And I'll explain to you why. So say 
I have a million dollars in deposits, right? So I, I lend out a million dollars. Now people come, say, to take out a half a million dollars. Well, technically, I don't have it. I mean, they do because of things like they put money on, they deal with the Fed as well and on deposit. It's a little different with credit unions, but, you know, so they could get that money and whatnot. But technically, they shouldn't be lending out any money unless they have more than that because they should be able to cover all their deposits and all their loans. They should only be loaning out more than what, you know what I mean, which you couldn't really do unless people gave you money to invest in loans. But with every other bank, commercial banks, like which were combined with the investment part of the bank. So in the 90s when Bill Clinton was president, they had an act called the Glass-Spiegel Act. And what this did was you had two types of banks. You had like a commercial bank where you deposit your money and get a car loan or a loan for a house and whatever. And then you had the investment side of the bank where you'd give them money to invest in stocks and bonds and whatever other ridiculous products they could come up with, like derivatives. And I don't know at that point that they had derivatives, but they would have all these types of financial products. And this is where the whole zeitgeist thing gets pissed off and whatever. And really, I that's part of the the what they're talking about that I understand, but without the Fed, none of this would happen. So anyway, because of the Federal Reserve, they w- will cover them. So they only have to have 10% on deposit with the Federal Reserve, meaning that if you have a million dollars, 10% of a million dollars is 100000 you can lend out 900000 Now, th- here's where it gets even more fucked up. And they go actually go through this in Zeitgeist. So they do some positive things in the first movie. I'm not saying that they don't. But the negative totally outweighs the positive, what they're trying to do. Anyway, um, so say that $900,000 you deposit into that same bank or even another bank. It it actually really doesn't matter. So you just created $900,000 out of nothing. After the Fed created a bunch of money, you know, um, how much did I, a million dollars out of nothing. So all this money is being created out of nothing. It's just, it's usually done through transactions, not, you know, actually printing cash, but they can print cash. Um, I believe the Department of Treasury actually prints the cash um, and they'll buy bonds. Basically, they'll buy bonds from the Department of Treasury and then they'll give them, you know, the money. But it's usually just like book moves um, where they'll credit their account for a certain amount of money. But so say they deposit the 900000 in the same bank. Or another bank, it doesn't matter, but we'll say the same bank so we can stick with this one bank. So now they have $900,000. So they take 10% of that, which is what? Not 9000 90000 And then they can lend out 810000 And then it keeps going. And I guess the average is like nine times. So they've just created all this money. Money is debt. Because you look at it, when you create money, that money is owed. When the Fed creates money, they give it to somebody, usually a bank or the U.S. government. And the U.S. government is so fucked up is that instead of just printing their own money, they have the Fed print money and they have to pay interest to the Fed which is insane. Now, when China buys bonds, it's a little different because you're talking about another country. But when you're talking about your own country 
why wouldn't you just print the money and then you don't have to pay any interest on it? In fact, you really don't have to pay yourself back. I would say that you would pay yourself back in order to burn that money and take it out of circulation. But I don't know. Um, But that's what it was. Where do you think that interest goes? Now, technically, the money that they make, they issue a balance sheet, goes back to the U.S. government. But it's nothing compared to what they paid them because these bankers are making money off it. It's a private bank, but it's not because it's appointed. The head of the Federal Reserve is appointed by the president. However, it's owned by private bankers, have stock in it or whatever. So essentially money is all created from debt because when they give out a loan, what is that? That loan is owed back when the Fed gives money to the bank. The money is owed back. And because of the Fed, not only do these banks, but the investment banks, the venture capitalists, all of these fuckers, they essentially have unlimited amounts of money. So I don't know who did it in Vegas, but in Orlando, a company called Blackstone bought up all the houses. Not all of them, but, you know, between them and a bunch of other companies, uh, companies they bought up the majority of the houses. I have an article where it talked about Blackstone. I don't believe it talked about the other companies. So what they did was by buying those up and having an unlimited amount of cash, they were able to outbid anybody trying to buy a house. Because if you're trying to buy a house and the house is selling for you know a hundred thousand dollars. And you're not going to pay more than that. But them, they don't give a fuck. They'll pay more. Because even though you could say technically they do owe the money back to the bank, but just how it works is they can get loans on top of loans. And it's it goes way over my head as far as how much I know. But, I mean, I know enough to you know, talk about it to a certain extent, but that's what they did. So by all these houses being bought, it doesn't matter that they were bought by a company. They basically rigged the housing market to increase because it's all based on supply and demand. So the supply's gone. The demand is there because all the people trying to buy the houses were outbid And that's what happened in Las Vegas as well. So this is all because of the fucked up monetary system. And a lot of these companies made money all the way through. Meaning that they made money off the loans. Then, because it's all fucking profit to them. Think about it. When they loaned the money in the first place, they created that money out of nothing. So how can you, if you never get paid back, it was created out of nothing anyway, and they write it off. But they ended up selling the loans, because that's an asset, and a lot of companies do this, and I've worked for timeshare companies and they, that have sold their own loans uh, or that have you know, given their own loans. Um, in the past, and then they can put together a loan for portfolio to finance whatever, um, to get a loan to do, uh, to sell them off. Just like, like if you have a student loan, I'm sure it's been sold a couple times and I don't know exactly how that works. I'm sure they sell it for less, but what they did was they had the ratings companies, a lot of these banks rate the shitty loans uh, 
and a lot of people know this if you watched, you know, some of the movies that talked about it. They rated the shitty loans at like triple A and then they sold them off to another company. Then they knew that all those loans were going to be defaulted on. So somehow you're able to bet against them, which is derivatives. You're able, which is insane. You're able to bet that those loans that you used to own, well, own the receivable on, that you used to have the receivable on, that now another company has the receivable on their books, meaning when I say receivable, meaning, you know, they're owed that money, and you know they're shitty loans, and you can actually bet on them, essentially, that they're going to default. And then when they default, you end up making a bunch of money. And then when the housing market crashed, all the prices of the houses went way down. Most people left their house, foreclosed. I owned a townhouse. I declared bankruptcy because it was 262 and it went down to 80,000. And I was like, fuck that. Plus that I was able to get rid of my credit cards and I got laid off from my job. So it kind of worked out because I didn't have to pay any money back on it. But it um, it's fucked up because, you know, I don't believe in government anyway. But if you're going to bail out the banks and they're going to get all this money, why don't they use it to pay off the fucking loans? Meaning that, okay, you got the money that you lost on the people that didn't pay back these loans that you loaned out, even though you probably made money anyway. So in my case, I probably paid like 60000 already in interest, which means at least, which means that it would only be 200000 They They don't account for it this way, but in theory, they lost 200000 you could say. And then they sold it for eighty, so they lost a hundred and twenty. So if they got money that covered all these loans, they also got to keep the house. Why? If your loans got paid off, then the people should have been able to keep them. And this is the only circumstance where, you know, when it comes to government and I guess that would be a handout in a sense, but people got screwed over by the banks and whatever. And it's a whole big thing, but that people should have got to keep their houses. If the banks, you know, the banks that paid them back, I guess that's different. Although they were able to make a bunch of money before they paid them back, but the people should have got to keep their houses then, or at least have it reduced to, So the banks were the ones who destroyed the whole economy. So they should have been able to have it reduced to what it was worth. So like if my house was reduced to, okay, well now you only owe them 80,000. And if you would have took off the fucking interest that I paid, I would have owed them 20,000. But no, they wouldn't do that. They'll bail out the banks, but not the people. Because they don't give a fuck about the people. That's not how it works. So essentially, that's the you know banking system in America. Um, I guess a summary of it. I mean, I, like I said, I'm not an expert on it, but you know, I know enough to kind of explain it. The other thing is, of course, they manipulate, the government manipulates markets along with, well, along with the banks. So meaning that, you know, when you talk about something, scarcity of something or the supply, they control it. They do it with uh, oil all the time because they want to control the price. So they manipulate markets all the time. It's all rigged. It's all controlled. And at the same time, you know, I don't want to insult, and I've said this before, you know, people that were 
slaves, like real slaves, but essentially we are all slaves to the government. Now, in the zeitgeist thing, they they say that, but they say it for a different reason. We're slaves to the government because we're extorted by the government by force, meaning that we work for them. We're paying them. I don't know about you, but let me calculate exactly what I'm going to end. Well, I'm going to be off a little because I still got two more paychecks, but I'll estimate them. Um, So if I take, um, again, these are estimates, but they'll be close enough. What I've made so far about this year plus what I'm going to make. Okay. And then what I'm going to be taxed. I'm going to estimate that too. And we'll do a percentage. So it's going to come out to about 25%. And it was about the same last year. And I think I got like 800 bucks back. So it was still about 25%. And that, I'm not somebody who, you know, I do okay. I don't make over $100,000 a year. I will say that. But I I do okay. I'm not, you know, struggling or anything like that. Or I'm not, uh, I'm far from poverty. (laughs) Put it that way. I mean, as I said, you know, together between me and my girlfriend, you know, it's, well, my fiance, it, it's over a hundred thousand. We'll say not much, but it is. But that's not counted in there because we're not married. But to pay twenty five percent, and yes, this is not just taxes. This is Social Security. This is FICA. I'll never see that Social Security money anyway. So that whole bullshit of you know they're that's going to go back to you. It's not, not in my generation, you know, basically what we're doing now is just paying for the older um, generation. And at some point they're going to get rid of it, which I agree with that. They, they should, but I think government should go away anyway, that we should get that money and be able to invest it how we want because they totally rip you off. They barely give you inflation. So you think of 25% of your money, That's a lot of fucking money, 25%. That's a pretty big percentage. Now, it's nothing compared to people that make in the millions and they're getting 50%. And I don't get state tax because I live in Nevada. Imagine if I got taxed on the state level as well. But that's just, people forget about this. That's just my income tax. I pay sales tax. I pay tax on every bill I have. Look at your electric bill. You pay a tax on that. Look at your phone bill. You pay a tax on that. Look at your fucking cable or direct TV bill. Um, Of course, gas. If you smoke, you pay a pretty big tax on cigarettes. Nevada, not really as bad compared to other states, luckily. Um, Not that I care. I don't smoke, but... So, you know, food, most food you don't pay tax on unless it's prepared food. But you think of just on pay income tax alone, which they do not have the right, first of all, to make you pay income tax, although they make you pay income tax anyway. First of all, they don't have the authority to, you know, tell you to do anything. But I'm saying based on their laws you're only supposed to pay tax on money made from foreign countries. But somehow with the 16th Amendment, they were able to start a voluntary tax that turned into a you have to pay it. 
and they kept changing the tax code and um, trying to make it harder to find, but no. But you'll still go to jail even though there's no law that says that you have to pay income tax on income that you make within the United States. How fucked up is that? That's because they interpret laws any way they want. They do whatever they want. I don't know how to convince people of this. I have so many examples. I I talk about it every fucking night I do the show. I I mean, not the same thing, but I mean, more examples and more examples. And it's like, it just gets worse and worse. You don't have any say. You don't have any power. And if you, if you think you have say in the government, Call up your congressman and try to get something done. Besides something that's totally irrelevant. Because they want to keep the illusion of freedom. Try to get them on the phone, first of all. And then from getting them on the phone, see if you ever get anything more than a form letter. That probably wasn't typed by them anyway. Plus... Countries should never be this big. I actually posted a a video on Facebook, which was really good, uh, that talked about if you're going to have countries, that they should be really small because then, you know, you can choose which country to live in based on their laws. And you can have more impact in elections, even though... You know, once you get to the millions, you're you're still not going to. But that won't happen. The United States wouldn't give up any state. I don't give a fuck if they got it on the ballot or not. If you followed their rules, you'd have to just say a bunch of people would have to get together on their own and say, we're seceding from the union. So I don't want to get too much off topic here, but that's pretty much. uh, Oh, the other thing that we're all uh, collateral on the debt. We're extorted by the government by force. So when I say by force, it doesn't mean the force necessarily has to take place, but it's at least threat of force. Because if I don't pay my taxes, or say I claim six, right? And at the end of the year, I owe taxes and I just don't file it. They're going to use force to come and kidnap me and put me in jail. And I never consented to any of this. There's things I would pay for. Not much. But there's a few things I might pay for, especially if I didn't get the money taken out. Even with all the money that the government takes in taxes, you still have a whole lot of charities that people donate to. Imagine if they didn't take anything out in taxes how much people would donate charity-wise. Because that's one of the things that people would bring up. Well, if there was no government, what about, you know, the people that couldn't afford, you know, this and whatever? And even now there's a bunch of charitable places where they could go. But there'd be even more because people would know that the government's not going to help because there is none. Plus, they're not getting taxed, so they have more extra money. So anyway, um, there's also, you know, the international banking cartel, the World Bank, the IMF. They like to loan money to countries. They like them to default on the loan so then they can take control of the countries. It's just fucked up. Or they can manage the bankruptcy So that's currently how it is, and I took way too long on um, getting into that. So a free market economy, and this is what I believe a free market economy is. Now, most of it, I would say, is factual. However, it's, you know, a lot of it is also my personal opinion of how I would define a free market economy. 
Because first of all, in a free market economy, there's no government involvement, period. And I don't know how there could be in a free market economy. Because to me, if there's government involvement, it's not a free market economy. It's not a free market. That's the definition of free markets. And that's what capitalism really supposed, is supposed to be. What happens is they call what we currently have now capitalism on purpose. The reason why they do that is to manipulate people. Because the way that the powers that be want things to go is more towards socialism and fascism, ways to control people. Of course, it won't affect them at the top because they're the oligarchy that will be running things. But it will affect all of, you know, the 99% or 95%. I don't know how many people would actually, uh, you know, get in, get into the uh, that elite status, but not a lot. Well, it would be a lot number-wise because even 1% of the population would be like 3 million people. So it would probably be 1%. So to me, the free market is based on private property and self-ownership. And everything from there kind of just fits in based on that. So, one, you have to be able to own your property, obviously, to trade or to sell it, you know, whether you're a business or not. And you have to have the right of self-ownership, I think, to own something else. Uh, Not a person, but to own, you know, property. So I believe in a free market economy, you can use whatever you want, that it's a voluntary transaction between individuals. Now, you can do that now, sort of, but you can't open a business and really do that with every transaction because the IRS will be all over you at some point. But I believe whether you want to accept gold or silver or U.S. dollars or whatever dollars, that that's your right. That And that's with individuals. When it comes to other countries, say you have a big business where you need supplies from other countries or product from other countries. Say you have a electronic store or something. I don't even know if there's that many around anymore because of the internet. But say you have an internet electronic store and you, you know, need the inventory and you are importing it into your warehouse. That, there are no tariffs or import fees on any of those. Now, when it comes to other countries, you really don't have any control over if you import something into another country, they may charge you. But of course, you try to negotiate, well, I'm not charging your country any tariff, so don't charge me. And if you're talking about a free market world economy, then, you know, there would be no tariffs. But that would be uh, meaning that the whole world is government free, which it should be. The market is what makes the decisions in a free market economy. And people don't realize the market is the people. What has happened with all these big corporations, and this is the other thing that the government likes, is that it's hard to boycott a huge corporation. Because if if 
people stop shopping there, they have so many people and so many stores that it's hard to make a difference. If you had a lot more small businesses, it'd be a lot easier to make a difference. And you could easily put somebody out of business. So if you weren't doing what you should be doing, if you weren't providing the best service and you weren't, you know, treating people well and you weren't doing all these things, the markets would work because one, businesses that weren't needed would go out of business, at least maybe not needed in that area. And businesses that treated people badly, businesses that were racist or discriminated, because I believe that in a free market economy, that your business is your business, meaning you can do whatever you want, you know, within reason. I don't believe that you can like beat up your employees and shit. But, I mean, as as long as it doesn't conflict with, of course, you know, things like the non-aggression principle and hurting people and whatever. But even if somebody's racist, you know, I don't agree with that. But I believe that they have the right to not hire whoever they don't want to hire based on whatever reason they don't want to hire them on. Now, what will happen, and this is the whole point, that people are the market. So if you had a lot of small businesses, what would happen is that would get out there. And I know I'm talking about people will say, well, that's a utopian view. It's really not if you have small businesses, but it would get out there. It would get into the media. And, you know, you'd lose business if if not go out of business because of that. And that's the whole point. Plus who would want to work for somebody who was racist anyway, so they can hide. I mean, you know, a lot of these people are, and they just hide it because, you know, they have to hire somebody. And, But this way, if people were allowed to do what they want to do, which they should, it's their business, but then you'd know if they discriminated against gay people or they discriminated against black people or whatever, if they didn't want to hire somebody because of their race or because of whatever other reason. And the same in how they treated them. Well, that, I mean, you can still do anyway. You can treat people badly and they can just not come back. But then you'd know that, you know, the owner here is racist or the manager. And then the owner finds out and fires the manager and says, hey, I don't want, you know, somebody that discriminates against people working for me. So in a free market economy, you're free to run your business how you want. Again, within as long as you don't hurt anybody steal from anybody you know the non-aggression principle stuff but as far as hiring who you want to hire that you don't need to give a reason but you can hire whoever you want you can run your business how you want it's your business now i know there's people that will say well but you're open to the public well what is so what what does that have to do with it because you're open to the public that means what you can do whatever you want in your own house. People don't understand that, you know, people have the right to feel how they want to feel. Now I don't agree with a lot of that, but that's your freedom and you can't expect you to have freedom and then take freedom away from other people because you don't agree with their views. But you do have the right to boycott their business and stand outside with signs. 
and probably put them out of business. Now, of course, a place like Walmart, or if you are dealing with all these big corporations, it's going to be a lot harder. And that's the downside to that is that when it comes to corporations, they've gotten so big that people can't really, I mean, you can try, like I try to avoid shopping at Walmart, but it's hard to make a difference because they're just so big. But they wouldn't get that big if it wasn't for the government and it wasn't for the banking system. They wouldn't. You take away the the government and the banking system and the Fed, none of these companies would be as big as they are for the most part. Maybe you'd find some here or there. And they definitely wouldn't get that big by treating people badly. They'd never they'd never make it. So that's in my opinion how the market should work. Now how it should work regarding money, of course, no Federal Reserve, no government currency. I believe personally everything should be backed by gold. Now it's up to store owners what they want to accept. But, you know, there's nothing stopping people if there wasn't the government to do it to create a gold-based currency. A currency that was backed by gold. I would just rather fucking, you know, I know for people they think it's a hassle, but, you know, just fucking give me the gold. (laughs) Give me the silver. This is how much this is, you know, of gold or of silver and do it that way. So the other thing is, There'd be no regulations, none. And I know people say, well, you know, owners wouldn't let people take, you know, sick leave and vacation and maternity leave and all this stuff. And yeah, they would because they wouldn't have any fucking employees left. Because what would happen is with competition, if if there was more competition because you wouldn't have all these big corporations because they wouldn't be able to throw around the money that they can, they wouldn't be able to get loan over loan over loan because the money wouldn't exist because they wouldn't be able to create, there'd be no fractional reserve banking. So they wouldn't be able to do that. People would have to compete for employees as well. So they'd have to give them certain benefits to attract employees to work for them. So the other things, of course, there would be no taxes along with, as I mentioned, no government regulations, no tariffs, at least going out and I can't control what other countries do. Um, the quality of businesses would go up because again, there'd be more competition. And when there's more competition, now the zeitgeist people look at competition as a negative thing. Competition is a positive thing because it forces you to innovate. It forces you, it gives you an incentive to improve. You have to make sure that you have great customer service that you cater to people, that you get them to come back. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not room for plenty of of stores that do similar things because there is that there's not enough market share because there is. 
It will also make it a lot easier. The barriers to entry will go down. The other thing that I see happening is the same way, say you have a restaurant. Right now you have the Department of Health. Instead of the Department of Health, you have private companies that inspect your store. You don't have to do that, but most people don't want to just eat at a restaurant if they don't you know, trust that it's been inspected. So you hire these private companies to certify you. And they'd probably do a lot better job than the government, who's probably easily paid off. And you do it that way. So a lot of these things that the government does, some of them would disappear and some of them wouldn't. They would just be private and private in the sense that the company would pay them to do it. Because they'd have a lot more money being that they're not being taxed. They're not having to put in all these regulations that the government's mandating. And again, it would be up to the people if they feel that, you know, certain government regulations like, you know, I don't know, a handicap uh, entry or whatever, if some place didn't want to put that in. They'd lose customers or other things. So a lot of these things that the government mandates, some of them unnecessarily, a lot of them, but some of them I think they should have them. I just don't think they should be forced to have them. And again, at the barrel of a gun in 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 a sense because they'll shut you down. And if you try to reopen, they'll arrest you. The other thing that it would do is, as I mentioned, eliminate businesses that aren't needed. This is the same with taxes. You have all these things that taxes go to that shouldn't exist. But they exist because nobody has to actually uh, give them money voluntarily. They get it from taxes. So they're able to exist because you're extorted otherwise you'd go away the same thing with businesses if people aren't shopping at your business if people don't like your business if it's just something that it's a service that people don't need it will go out of business so you'd have better businesses more accountable businesses Um, businesses that would probably treat employees better because they'd be competing for employees because there'd be a lot more independently owned places. More people would be owners of businesses because the barriers to entry would be less. So if somebody has a dream of opening a restaurant or this or that, their dream would be a lot more obtainable because now who knows how corrupt it is to get past building expect inspectors and this and that. And if they say, Oh yeah, I'll approve your building. If you pay me, you know, a payoff or whatever. The other thing is when it comes to copyright and intellectual property laws, I don't believe in those same thing let the market decide whoever can do it the best there'd be more innovation there'd be cheaper products there'd be better products because you may build off of somebody else's idea where now you can't because you can't afford to you know pay them the money to be able to use their quote-unquote patent once you release something out there as far as I'm concerned, it's public domain. It's like if you release a song out there and somebody else does it and they do it better, I don't think they owe you anything. That might be the right thing to do, and people might do that. But technically, I don't think they owe you. You put it out there, 
it's public domain as far as I'm concerned. And you've had people like, I believe, Walt Disney. I don't know if it was him or his family, you know, increase the amount of years uh, for intellectual property or copyrights with, uh, I think, songs and movies and things like that. I mentioned, you know, private certifications, depending on the type of business that you are, you want people to know that, hey, we, you know, been certified by this company and this, and maybe you'll even get certified by multiple companies just to show, hey, we uh, want you to know that it's important that our customers know that we're a safe business or that we're a business that's been inspected. Our food is fine. Um, it's edible. <laughs> I'm saying edible, but it's, we follow all safety procedures. We follow this and whatever. So of course the issue is the government, you know, being in the way of all this, you know, the government, wanting to regulate as much as possible and they don't they don't do it because they give a fuck that's the whole thing is they don't regulate businesses because they care it's all fees money all of this shit i believe in in clark county a liquor license goes for at least a hundred thousand dollars for what what is it that cost uh how can you justify that it's ridiculous and i remember in boston when they had cab medallions which i don't know what's going on with that now with uber and lyft and whatever but it it, it was worth like you know five hundred thousand dollars or something in new york city i think it's a million dollars which is you know a cab medallion the right to be able to drive a cab in that city And they had to purchase them. But over the years, if you had one that you bought, you know, years before that, the price kept going up. So uh, I'm trying to kind of get through this quick, but that's how I see a a free market as being totally free. If I want to open up my own business right now, I just open up my own fucking business. And it's up to the people whether they want to go there or not. And that's how it should be. And if they want to boycott it, they have the right to do that. Again, the market is the people. People don't understand that when people say, well, the market decide. They think like the market is... Something else. I don't know what they think it is, but the market means the people. Like voting. People are so into voting and think they have a say in the candidates. Which they obviously don't. But you have a say in where you go and how much money you spend. And the more people that say hey, we're not going to, you know, it's a lot easier to start a boycott of a store and actually be successful than, you know, to get a candidate elected. At least if you're dealing with, you know, a store that's not backed by the government, that's not a big corporation that, you know, the government would essentially uh, take care of that. So I'm going to take another break. When we come back, I'm going to get into the Zeitgeist Venus Project, this socialist uh, idea of how to run, not just run the economy. I would look at it as just running the country. It's, it's, insane so we'll play a a clip from um that talks about it and then when we come back uh we'll go into it in uh, detail so we'll be right back after this 
nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm gonna make sure I didn't I don't play the same uh one that I played last time. And now I don't hear it playing at all. Oh that's why let me go back to the This end. man wants to change the economy as we know it to solve the ills of society. I think he really might be on to something. He's a filmmaker, musician, activist, author, and most importantly, the founder of the worldwide zeitgeist movement to promote global sustainability. I have seen the first Zeitgeist film, and I was skeptical. I did spend a lot of time in conspiracy theories when I was younger, but largely outgrew it. They were fun to look at, but none of them are valid enough to lend any credibility to. Part 3 I agreed with in part, but I do disagree with the idea that you don't have to pay taxes. Part 1 I agreed with at first, but I brought these ideas up to fellow atheists who showed me why this was total crap. I largely put that film behind me and ignored the sequel, knowing the reliability of the first one. A friend of mine I knew from way back got suckered into the whole Zeitgeist Addendum movie. He started telling me that I should watch it and get down on the Venus Project too. As he explained it, it sounded like listening to a Karl Marx audiobook. People are forced to use money! When you hit that punch clock at work, you're entering a dictatorship. We need to get rid of money because it exploits people down with evil capitalism. So I watched the movie, and it was pathetic. Every possible and conceivable error you can make in economics was made in this movie. Planned obsolescence, predatory pricing, free market monopolies and cartels, conflating economic systems as Keynesian, and conflating government actions as capitalism. I've noticed that a few of my other friends also got suckered into this crap, so I spent my time exposing why the RBE is not a viable solution to their problems. Later, Zeitgeist 3, Moving Forward, came out, so I watched it. Supposedly, it was supposed to be what Zeitgeist Addendum was supposed to be if it wasn't rushed and laced with conspiracy theories. I noticed something this time. I felt like I was being hypnotized. The sad music, the creepy bell sound, the soothing voice that's explaining all the world's harsh realities. It became apparent that I wasn't watching a documentary. I was watching a manipulative propaganda film. The eerie music and violent, horrific imagery was a play on my emotions. Peter Joseph began trying to make me feel guilty for being a part of this system. He begins to show me that I was indoctrinated into this system and that I was meant not to feel guilty, but I should feel guilty if I wasn't indoctrinated. I am a brain-dead zombie who manipulates people for my well-being. I have no choice but to do this evil stuff, but there is only one solution to get out of it. Join us. Another thing that bothered me about the movement was the organizational structure. The organizational structure appears to be a well-hidden pyramid-shaped structure. The leaders, of course, are Peter Joseph Marola running the activist arm, underneath Jock Fresco and Roxanne Meadows, who are in charge of organizing the planning and the political aspects of it. What they say goes. Under Marola, a group of mostly anonymous global administrators who issue bans on their forms with no appeal process whatsoever. We have seen users get banned for questioning the aspects of the Venus Project, even outside of the forms of, press, of oppressive confines. Explanations given for these bans usually consist of accusing the person of being a troll. Virtually anyone who le has legitimate concerns with the Venus Project are also labeled as trolls. Fresco and Meadows are the gatekeepers. They are the ones with all the answers to all of mankind's problems. They are the quintessential guru of the group, and they decide and dictate the direction of the movement. And Marola is the attack dog who keeps the others in line. A scholarly critic, Muertos, offered a challenge to the Zeitgeist movement to read the book Seeing Like a State. Their reaction was to label him a troll because they didn't like his choice of words describing them and 
demanding to know what his magical system for fixing the world was. And I received an almost identical reaction when I issued my challenge as well. Their opposition of trolls is much the same as Scientology's suppressive persons concept, wherein any person who criticizes Scientology is labeled a suppressive person, and people are to disassociate themselves from them. They circulate propaganda within the group to show that anyone with this label is deemed unfit to participate. When they do decide to confront you, one of the many charges against you are, what have you ever done to help humanity? I contend this is a form of Melu control that the Zeitgeist movement is also guilty of. Needless to say, I can hardly contrast the Zeitgeist movement's actions in the same light as Heaven's Gate, Jonestown, Scientology, Children of God, and many other abusive cults. But the only reason why is because their actions are purely limited to internet activity. If these people were to build a city, I would be more concerned about the group's actions. However, these are irrelevant if you look at what the group is asking here. They are the ones proposing the system, the only system to save humanity. To say they are a cult, religious, or a bunch of cranks is negating the main issue. Will the resource-based economy work? No. Shortly after Mortos issued his video version of his challenge, I thought it would be a good idea to issue a challenge of my own. My challenge is as follows. Without sound money, without private ownership of all means of productions, and without exchange, it cannot work. Remove one of these components and you have a recipe for disaster. A team of scientists, a huge computer, could never and have never found the marginal utility of any good, ever. If it cannot evaluate the priorities accurately, resources will be wasted and rationing will have to occur. How do I know? Humanity has tried this millions of times. In industrial attempts, people die of starvation. They've tried computers, they tried engineers, they tried science. Science is for figuring out what to use resources for. Economics is for given the amount of resources available to make the product, if it's a good idea to make it, who should get it, and at what cost. To say that economics can somehow teach you to make the best iPhone, or that science could tell you how to dis properly distribute the cell phone, is to completely disregard the ideas behind science and economics. Now, I issued my challenge under one caveat, to read a 50-page article. Most everyone refused or gave up after just starting in, into it a few pages in. I reduced the challenge to watch two one-hour-long lectures. No one bothered even finishing the first one. Others who claimed they understood it without actually reading the article or watching the videos demonstrated to me they completely misunderstood the argument. They quickly show the problems of the United States system, even though we don't have sound money and exchange is often very regulated in a lot of sectors. Neil, a.k.a. VTV, from the show V Radio, attempted to address my argument, which was a complete straw man. Later, he also pro brought up the project Cybersyn. The video I used in my retort to him made an analogy with The Wizard of Oz. Then it dawned on me. They're not interested in saving the world, at least according to their actions. The Venus Project is a dream. It is only a dream. It was never meant to materialize, because it's not a plan. Camelot. 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 It's only a model. In the story The Wizard of Oz, in which is an ironic analogy for the gold standard, Dorothy is introduced to a brave new world. Her quest is given to her by the townspeople to follow the yellow brick road of awareness. This difficult and strange journey will result in new friends who will also join your quest as the evil capitalist witches try and thwart your attempts at your goal. When she arrives, she realizes that the wizard is a lie. The city is just a fancy mock-up and just promotes the grandiosity of the system it proposes and serves little to how the world would actually function. A total distraction of, to the real problem, scientists who can solve the problems are just smoke and mirrors, and the central computer is just the velvet curtain and hiding the real puppet master. 
because of this, it serves me best the end of the debate with the Zeitgeist Movement and the Venus Project. They only serve to feed the wizard's ego and wallet, and not his ideas. There is no plan. There is no project. There will always be films and the donation cup. A resource-based economy versus today's monetary system. In a RBE, all of the Earth's resources are declared as the common heritage of all the world's people. Whereas in today's monetary system, the world's resources are owned and controlled by a few nations, bankers and corporations. In a RBE, all goods and services are abundantly available to everyone without the need for means of exchange like money, credits, barter and so on. But today most goods and services are kept artificially scarce for most of the world's people with the use of debt-based currency. In a RBE, we utilize the most current technological and scientific advances to provide the highest possible standard of living for all people on Earth. Yet today, your standard of living completely depends on your purchasing power, leaving billions of people in extreme poverty. In a RBE, we develop and only use clean, renewable energy sources. However, today, we fight over fossil fuels polluting the world and each other. A RBE is in alignment with the scientific method, making it open to falsification, also known as an emergent system that embraces change. However, today's monetary game is an established capitalistic system in alignment with profit, politics, poverty and war. In a RBE, we embrace automation to free people from boring and repetitive work. Whereas today, automation is primarily used to make more money for corporations at the expense of most people eventually losing their job and thus income in order to survive. A RBE will create new... Kim Forsyth here, better known as the New World Optimist. Uh, I have decided to take my usual online debating forum, which is normally Facebook, and kick it up a notch to hopefully make it a little more interactive and bring it over here to YouTube. So this is my first video. Uh, I'm sure as I go along, things will get a lot better and a lot more interesting. But for the first one, I want to discuss one of the biggest differences that I can think of between communism and a resource-based economy. Now, in my opinion, yeah, a resource-based economy is kind of like communism. However, I will say one big thing is that the communism that we know and love today, you think of, you know, totalitarian China and you think of Russia, uh, is that they're kind of a hybrid of an increasingly capitalist global economy. So they're, they're based on capitalism, but they're kind of flying under the guise of communism. But it's not for the purposes that we would normally think of when you think of communism, like working together. It's more of a capitalist ideal. So I think one of that is one of the biggest differences. Um, we also must understand, as you watch the rest of these videos, that something like a resource-based economy has never been attempted in the history of humanity. Okay, so that, that says a lot right there. Communism, sure, we've got lots of examples of different forms of it, but a resource-based economy has never, ever been attempted, mainly because we have never seen the technology and the automation and all of that good stuff uh, before. So, at least as far as we know. So, that's one of the biggest differences. So, uh, in my later videos, I'll go ahead and address some more points on the differences between communism and capitalism. But I think for the first video, this is pretty good. So Nonpartisan liberty for all. Call in at 702-470-7664 or Skype in. Username, Nonpartisan liberty for all. Nonpartisan liberty for all, and we are back. If you like to call in, have any comments on anything we're talking about, uh, you could call us at 702 470 7664. That's 702 470 7664. Or you can Skype in username nonpartisan liberty for all. So I was just about to get to. 
and we had played a couple clips on it. One, I guess, was a positive uh, review. I don't know if I would call it a review, but uh, a positive take on a resource-based economy. I think these people are fucking nuts. And I'll I'll play uh, a couple sentences from this. There there was just long uh, YouTube video that's like an hour, but I want to play a couple of sentences from it that are like you know ten seconds that just show kind of the craziness uh, of it. But what a so th- to give a little background on this. It comes from the Zeitgeist movies, I guess. And then they started the Venus Project. But the first Zeitgeist movie had nothing to do with it. It had to do with 9-11 being an inside job. It had to do with the monetary system, which I just talked about, and how that's fucked up, and how you can the banks can create money, essentially, with... Um, fractional reserve banking and the fed can create money and having a central bank and all of those things so even if they were to you know have a government which as i always say it's kind of hard for me because i'm totally against government but i'm trying to look at things also from the standpoint of okay if we kept government what, how would this work? Um, But when it comes to the Fed, whether there's a government or not, the Fed should go, should totally go away and money should be issued by the Department of Treasury and it should be backed by something. Now, I think it would be hard for them to, with all the money that's out there, um, I don't know what they would do to, they'd have to rein in so much of that money and uh, we'd probably have a depression. So anyway, so their basic, the foundation of them, and it's totally socialist. Now this guy said he used to be a libertarian and the maker of uh i can't think of his name right now shit i've heard it so many times this week you'd think i uh it'd be right on my mind i think it's john something though but um i thought i had a video with his name on it anyway uh regardless of that he said he used to have libertarian ideas in an interview and then he kind of uh, was thinking about, well, what's the solution to this? And he came to the conclusion that all problems are from the monetary system. At least this is what the general consensus is. Um, Because I didn't see the part of the movie where they talked about it, but from what I looked at, people that are part of the Zeitgeist and Venus Project, everybody that I saw talk about it basically agreed with these principles. So, and that believes in a resource based economy. So, in a resource based economy, everything is free. Yes, everything is free. So, you know, that might sound nice and everything, but. There are all these things that have to be done and people will not be paid for them, but they'll get everything for free. But then, you know, right away, of course, you think of, well, who gets what? Now, what if somebody, you know, everybody gets Ferraris, everybody gets a huge house, everybody, you know, obviously that can't possibly be the case because from a uh, standpoint of just being able to accomplish that, it, then you have, you know, things like innovation and people trying to get ahead in their job all that stuff becomes pointless. 
Now, there, at least one of the guys that had explained it, you know, his thing is, well, people will be into it, so they'll want it to work. And what will happen is, I mean, he, he sounded like an idiot, that so all banks will be gone. Uh, all accountants will be gone. He didn't know the name for accountant. So basically, all these people will get jobs that will uh, have to do with, you know, resources and things like bringing in resources and doing other things. And don't forget that everything that exists today, for the most part, will exist. Now, what they want to do, what I got from them is essentially they want monopolies on everything. So, excuse me. Sorry, cough button. I had to swallow. Um, so they want monopolies on everything because that would free up people's time, essentially. So one of the quotes from someone was, you know, if you have one store in one area, why would you need... Like, if you look at Las Vegas, I mean, it's like within... You have a supermarket a mile from your house no matter where you live for example. So I would assume like they would say, you know, in a 20 mile radius, there's one supermarket. So which would mean that they would want to take over central planning and there would have to be uh, somebody that controlled that, but we'll get to that. Um, so Getting back to the monetary system being the root of all problems, they believe that people are slaves not because they are taxed by the government or the government uh, allows the Fed to operate or any of that stuff or fractional reserve banking. Now, that might be part of it, but it's I because I guess that's part of the monetary system. However, they also don't agree with, it's not just the U.S. monetary systems. It's all monetary systems, and they don't agree with trade. Meaning that if I brought up earlier, you know, I'm going to trade my shoes for your jacket or something. And they don't agree with that neither. They think that, you know, that's the same thing as the monetary system. Which, that causes me to think more about the fact that, okay, are these, you know, based on the UN, th they're the connection kind of, you know, and I'll have to look up this guy. It's a, something Joseph, Peter Joseph, I think his name is, um, that... There is more to it than it's just the monetary system because it really makes no sense. So his philosophy or his whole thing in the interviews with him was that the monetary system is violence. Again, not taxes are violent, although he did say the government is violent, but not because of taxes, because people are forced to work to support themselves. That's an act of violence, that people in other countries starve to death. And I guess he blames that on the monetary system. How he can be so familiar with the monetary system of other countries, I don't know. Now, in the U.S., and I was actually, I talked to my fiance about this, and she knew somebody who worked at a, I believe, homeless shelter. And I've talked to other people and looked at other information on this. And most people that are homeless are homeless because they want to. And most experts will tell you that, even that work at homeless shelters. Because they could go to homeless shelters, they could go to their family, or, you know, a lot of them are either on drugs or mentally ill, and they don't want help. Um, you probably have a small percentage that are homeless that do want help, 
but there's help out there for homeless people. So the fact that the system is to blame. Now, I agree with them on the monetary system as far as the way it operates and the way that the government has set it up. It, I, I don't agree with it. I think it's fucked up. And I went through that when I talked about the free market system. I don't believe that it's the root of all problems. I do believe it causes a lot of problems because of the fact that the Fed can give all this money out to all the banks and all of that stuff. And, you know, I know a lot of people blame the banks for everything, although there are a lot to blame the banks for. Don't get me wrong. But I go back to the government and the government allowing the banks to do what they do and all a lot of that stuff. So, yes, I, I agree with what he went over with in the first uh, Zeitgeist movie. But the monetary system being the root of all problems, I disagree. Um, the monetary system is not putting me in jail or beating me up or harassing me or watching me or any, you know, any of the things that police would do or, uh, you know, spying on me. Um, all of these things that the government are doing to control our lives, um, a lot of it is not, has nothing to do with the monetary system. Now, they want you to be in debt. Don't get me wrong. And they were responsible for a lot of things. But to say that they are violence and to say that they, you know, violence is uh, the monetary system is based on violence is insane. And this this is the same thing that uh, Peter Joseph said. Um, let me see if I can find the an interview with another supporter of... Uh, the resource-based uh, economy. First of all, I don't know. I don't hate anything. Um, I think money has had its its function in the past. Today, it's simply failing at what it's actually supposed to do. It's become a machine that produces profit for like the top one percent and uses everybody else as their slaves that's what it does today when actually it it was supposed to be um, a, a, a mechanism of economy a mechanism to to provide everybody with what they need that's obviously not what it's anymore but I don't hate it because of that that's, that's simply wrong <laughs> I, I simply see it for what it is it's like an I don't know a 20 year old computer to me that's simply ridiculous to work with anymore today or like a, a steam engine driven car or I don't know what what I'm supposed to compare it with, but it's it's an it's an outdated concept, an outdated mechanism that maybe was useful a while ago or a long time ago, but today it simply doesn't doesn't do remotely what what it's supposed to do anymore. But again, I don't hate it. I don't know where you get that idea. But I can tell you that it sure looks like you love money, <laughs> so I can give that right back to you. Um, it's completely. So you can talk about inflation. First of all, you're talking about an inanimate object, so it's idiotic. And what it's supposed to do is it is not supposed to be able to support you and do all these things by itself. That's based on the amount of money you earn. Now, the only point that I got from that that it makes any real sense 
And it looks like, I mean, they have a following of like a cult is how I'd look at it. And I'm probably going to do a show just on them because we don't have a lot of time left. But it it seems like a cult to me. But you're talking about an inanimate object that it, it has lost purchasing power. But as far as all the other stuff, it's people that are doing that. It's people that are running these companies and running these banks. Now, because of the government, they are able to do certain things that they wouldn't be able to do if the system wasn't set up the way it was. So I'm against the monetary system in the United States the way it was. I'm not familiar the way it is. I'm not familiar enough with the monetary system in any other country to comment on it. I mean, I know most have central banks, which I'm totally against central banks because of that whole thing where they're able to print money. There's nothing to stop them from printing money. And it's, it's really uh, fucked up how they can affect things like inflation, which is really a hidden tax. You think about it. The government needs to generate money, right? They can do one of two things. They can print a bunch of money or they can tax you. So why wouldn't they just print money all the time? Well, because there are consequences to printing money, which is inflation. So this uh, monetary system being the root of all problems uh, and me being somebody who obviously supports true freedom and liberty, it is the cause of some problems, definitely. But when it comes to freedom, we have a lot more serious problems than the financial system. Now, I know that they're looking at things like what's done on the stock market and how, and I've talked a little about this or at least thought about it, how they're not producing anything. You know, when you're talking about venture capitalists and investment banks and they don't produce anything, they rob you of interest. I mean, now it's voluntary when you take out a loan. Okay. So you got to factor that in, but you know, they're kind of crooked. They charge you the interest that they charge you. And banks aren't even really that bad compared to like credit cards and stuff like that, where they're charging you ridiculous interest. But, you know, like on a home loan, I mean, the the, the interest rates now are what, like 4%. I mean, it's not that bad, but it's still, it's a lot of money when you're borrowing hundreds of thousands of dollars and they make all this money off of nothing meaning just borrowing money and all of these financial investments that are all based on just money, stock prices, ridiculous shit. Now, again, the majority of these things are government-based because... I wouldn't call stock government based because you could start a company and say, hey, I'm going to sell, you know, you own a piece of my company and you could sell stock. But a lot of these things are government creations because corporations, again, in themselves are government creations. So you got to keep that in mind, too. So the monetary system was created by the government, okay? And how you can go straight to a system that was created by the government who at the same time could change the monetary system or get rid of it is a little crazy. Um, But the fact that they're against trade as well, which has nothing to do with the monetary system, makes me question some things. So I'm going to go through this as quick as I can, and then probably next week we'll do a show, and I'll make sure that I've, I'm up to date on all the Zeitgeist movies as well, as as well as get more uh, information. But I got a lot of, I watched a lot of stuff and listened to a lot of people talk about 
uh, this. And it's just, it's insane to me. So they, um, the currently the monetary system again is caused by government and the the two worst things of course are fractional reserve banking and the fed printing their own money um but i believe that they had that first movie now i this may sound like a conspiracy i don't know i want to do more research into it but the first thing that comes to mind is that first movie was more libertarian i think than anything it was something that you'd see uh libertarians talk about like the monetary system and how fucked up it is and it explained you know fractional reserve banking and things like that so it's like people got sucked in by that first movie then all of a sudden it's well we want a resource-based economy and that's what makes me question a lot of things as well. So not a lot of people know about the banking system. Again, it's not taught in school. It's not something that they advertise, um, especially fractional reserve banking, which I don't think I knew about that till, you know, maybe the past five years, to be honest. I knew about the Federal Reserve, but I didn't know a lot about that till maybe the past five, ten years. It's not something that, you know, I was uh, looking into or thinking about or, or whatever. So the other thing is this loosely follows the same plan of the United Nations. Now, the United Nations came out with a 2013, basically, uh, or 2030, sustainability up until 2030, uh, basically an Agenda 21. Those are familiar with that for 2030. And it talks about, I, I read the, I think I read the whole thing. Um, the first one they came out with, the draft, that was 2015, and then they updated it to 2030. But um, or actually it was 2015 and beyond or something like that to 2030, um, something like that. But one of the things it goes through a lot of similar things and you can read between the lines, but it straight up said, you know, the poorer countries giving money to the richer countries. Um, you know, it talked about positive rights. Just again, for people who don't know about positive and negative rights, a negative right would be your right to self-defense, your right to put what you want in your body. A positive right would be your right to health care, your right uh, for somebody else not to carry a gun so you don't get shot, which makes no sense to me. But positive rights are not rights, but they're trying to convince people that they are that their rights and freedoms. And in this, they talk about free rights and freedoms. None of this has anything to do with rights and freedoms. So they want to eliminate the monetary system or barter of any kind, like I said, exchanging for goods. And again, that is a big question because... I understand if you don't support the monetary system. I don't support the monetary system currently as is neither. But I do believe that you need a system of exchange. Now, to me, like I said, I would go with gold because gold has value in what it is. That's why I like gold or silver. Paper does not have value in what it is. It doesn't have value, period. The only reason it has value, again, because of the government and because people believe it has value. Besides that, it doesn't have value. Um, so I'm fine with totally changing the monetary system, getting rid of the Fed, and... Well, getting rid of the government altogether. But for the sake of argument, we'll say if the government was to still exist, getting rid of the Fed, having money printed by the Treasury, all backed by gold. And I wouldn't even trust the Treasury, so I would have anything, uh, all money would have gold in it that was worth what um, 
I mean, you'd have to come up with a value of gold, just like the dollar, you know, the value goes up and down. Um, but whether it's, you know, a something shaped like a dollar with gold in it, and depending on how much money it is, it has a certain amount of gold in it. Um, you know, an ounce of gold is worth eleven hundred dollars right now, but you could have a lot less gold. I mean, um, so that's what I would want to see, and I wouldn't want to see anybody printing money because there's a deficit. If you don't have the money, you don't spend it. I understand that what they were doing was spending the money before they had actually collected the money, but they knew they did their budget. They knew they had a shortfall. You balance the budget, um, and that's it. So, and again, I'm just basing that on having a government, which I don't believe in. So I agree with them on that. But they expect after I think manipulating people and I think they were preying on those type of people that didn't know about the monetary system uh, to see it and, you know, keep watching the movies. And then all of a sudden it's, yeah, a resource based economy. The definition of a resource based economy is that everything is free and it's a world economy which is another thing similar to the UN that they they don't come out and say it but they want a world government they want world laws they want what they call freedom which is positive freedoms they want everybody to get along they want you know whatever basically they want an oligarchy at the top and the rest of us are you know peasants but um and they want people to give basically the rich countries give their money to the poor now that would be an easy thing to do if you just eliminated money um so they there was one video i had watched where they were trying to align with libertarians to a point and i'm not gonna say who it was but you know i don't know how much research he did beforehand but he was acting like oh they you know that's a good idea and whatever and you, you know if that's what you really believe you're not a true libertarian now i understand this video was like five years ago so maybe you've refined your ideas but um socialism is not a libertarian idea and this is just straight up uh, socialism. So um, they did, like I said, have some libertarian ideas in the first movie. So maybe that's all he had seen. Um, so I don't want to judge him based on not knowing, you know, what he knew. However, they were talking about it right there. And it seemed pretty obvious that it was being explained to him that this is what it is. Although he kind of gave it a libertarian spin as much as you could um, when you're talking about this. So so anyway, so they want to limit and eliminate the monetary system or any type of barter for goods that everything is free. Money does not exist. So. And their biggest issue seems to be with uh, banks and them making money off interest, whether it's loans or, uh, well, pretty much interest would be loans. Um, but what their beliefs seem to be is that society is responsible to take care of people. Uh, they oppose people forced to work to support themselves, that you shouldn't have to work. Because it's stressful. What if you get fired? Um, I don't know. All of this shit. Um, they're against all financial institutions. Although I would probably agree with them on that. Now, they talk about 
technology. So their theory is that, and it would only work if you had sophisticated robots that were able to do everything. Otherwise, this is not going to work, and I'll get into why. But currently, you don't have that. So the way it was explained by one person is nothing will change except everything will be free. Well, and people won't be paid for their job because there'll be no money. So I know right now, if I'm not getting paid for my job, I am not working there. There are other uh, ideas were now based on what I mentioned, it seemed like they want to take they wanted to take over central planning. And by doing that, they would reduce the amount of businesses. So there'd be no competition. They think competition is bad, that it somehow is violence. It it's it gets worse than this. But competition between companies is violence somehow, as well as working for a company and being forced to work to pay bills is violence. Um Everything's violence, I guess. I totally disagree with that. I don't see how working to pay bills is violence. I don't see how competition between businesses is violence. I think competition is a positive thing, as I had mentioned in free markets, where it gets people to up their games. You look at monopolies like the police, they don't give a fuck because they know there's no one to replace them. There's no, I mean, individual officers, yes, but as a company, if you want to look at them as a company or corporation or whatever, there's nobody to replace them. The government has a monopoly on them. So looking at it that way, it makes them treat people like shit. It makes their customer service suck. Now, beyond that, of course, they kill people, they beat people, they violate people's rights. And I've had all this done to me besides the killing, obviously. So, I mean, don't say it doesn't happen, not to mention all the research I've done um, as well. And people that I know that the same thing has happened to. And I've seen it. And, you know, so whatever. So something like competition... If you eliminate competition, no innovation because there's no need to, there's no improvements, there's no better customer service, there's no, you know, you complain about somebody, maybe they'll fire them, but why even bother? So what it sounds like is that they want to eliminate as much as they can, so then... All of these people that don't have jobs, including people that used to work at banks, that used to work on Wall Street, that used to be accountants, that used to do all these things, now they're going to help out with these other jobs. So people will be working less hours. This is how they present it, that people will be working maybe a couple days a week. So they'll have time to do all this stuff and and create all this stuff and innovate and all of that. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is like this, but, and obviously I do this show for free. So, I mean, I, but I have a cause I do it for, but a lot of these people, if they're not getting something out of it, Besides, you know, if they're not getting some kind of incentive or reward or something like that for producing what they're producing, it will decrease innovation. People will do less. They'll, less people will even work. Why work if you can get something for free? Especially on a shitty job where you're, 
you're saying that, oh, you work two days a week, um, you know, uh, gathering resources and and uh, fulfilling orders for places or working at the 7-Eleven or whatever you're doing. Unless you're doing something you love to do, why would you do why would you work at all? And this is why communism and socialism doesn't work. This is why it fails. And when it comes to money, the saying was, you know, yeah, it's great until the money runs out. Because there's no incentive for people. There's some people that will feel some obligation. But most people will be like, you know, there's a sense of accomplishment. There's a sense of of moving up the ladder, having a career and accomplishing something and saying, I went from this to this and I increased my salary and I increased my position and whatever. And you, you take all of that out. And essentially, it's total socialism because you make people equal. Because what's going to happen is, while they're controlling this centralized planning, and they're saying, you know, having all these monopolies and whatever, people are all going to be the same, exactly. Meaning that there's not going to be a bigger house There's not going to be the mansion. There's not going to be the Ferrari. There's not going to, well, I guess those would be made in other countries, but let's assume that this, the whole world did this. And I'm doing that because it's similar to what the UN is talking about, except for the fact that they're going to eliminate cash. Although there's been talk to go to a cashless society, however, you'd still use, you know, a card to buy stuff. So it wouldn't be the same cashless society that they're talking about. But basically, everybody would have the same thing is what it would end up with. Because then it makes it easier that, you know, there's one car company that makes the same car. There's one house company that makes the same house. You know, maybe there's a couple tweaks here and there, but the format the main design is the same. And that's exactly how it is. And this is exactly, I can't believe he said that, you know, he's not socialist, the the, the zeitgeist guy, because this is clearly a definition of socialism totally. And you'll get lines waiting for food and this and that because, again, a lot of people won't want to work. But not only that is you're going to reduce the amount of businesses and it won't be based on the market. It will just be based on, okay, you know, within this radius, we'll make sure there's a supermarket, there's this, there's that, and you all get the same shit is what it will be. So they're all saying, of course, how it's great and you'll be able to focus on other things and whatever. But um, they also talk about re-educating people. As I mentioned, violence, uh, you know, employment is violence. Poverty is violence. Working for money to support yourself is violence. How do you figure? Really? So they blame the monetary system or work for people's deaths. Now, I know when it comes to poverty um, and homelessness and stuff like that, A lot of it has to do with other countries. Um, It does happen here, but not like uh, other countries. And and as we said, a lot of people that are homeless, it's because they want to be homeless. Not that they want to be homeless. I mean, 
they'd rather be probably in a certain, you know, uh, positive situation. But I mean, compared to the alternatives, they want to be homeless. They'd rather just, you know, say, fuck it. I don't want help. I'll, you know, just be homeless. Mm -hmm. So I talked about central planning. Um, and that's what it would have to be, you know, and of course there would be the ruling class that would come out of that because who's going to make those decisions. So are you going to have elected officials make those decisions? That would be the central planners for each town, each city. How is that going to work? Along with everything else. And again, as I said, there'd be no reason to work. Nothing would get done. You know, who's going to do all this stuff? And there, there's no incentive to advance. There's no incentive to advance your career. And they say, well, you'd have all these days to do other things and you could do whatever. Um, one of the reasons why, like I thought of like a singer and because I think somebody mentioned that. And, you know, the reason that they're not a singer professionally most likely is because they're not good enough. And that's where the market works. You know, people that don't have good good songs that even come out with an album or people that aren't talented enough don't end up being professional singers because they're not talented enough. No one wants to hear them. That's the market at work. I don't think there'd be any new technology. There'd be no incentives for anything. Um, and they base this on, they bring up things just like the UN does of sustainable, you know, development. And one of the points that they did have, though, is that I brought up earlier, you know, scarcity of resources. And a lot of that is controlled by the government. And they rig that, whether it's oil or food with farmers or whatever. So they said that they would... Um, or the people that, you know, I have heard talk about it, that that would be something that they would, I guess, uh, attack as well. Um, now, how they would get all these resources in the first place and get control of all these things, there's no way they could do it peacefully um, because it's not going to happen. And that's where, you know, the UN comes in. And that's what makes me concerned about them. Again, otherwise, I just think they're a bunch of fucking quacks. Um, they also use faulty examples of things that are given away for free. Like they brought up, you know, music downloads and newspapers. and those are things that are promotional or people accepted that, you know, music is downloaded. Just like when music started playing on the radio, they were against it at first, but then they used it as a promotional tool. Now what groups do is they go and tour and that's how they make money. And you know what? I brought this up before. Who says because you can write a fucking song you should be a millionaire? Now, if you can become a millionaire off of, you know, in this climate, off of making music, hey, great for you. If you can get people to buy an album or give you money or whatever for your music and you can make money off touring, um, I have no problem with people making whatever amount of money they can make. But what I'm saying is people have been, uh, I hate using the word brainwashed, but just accustomed to anybody who does music 
you know, being a millionaire and from writing one song, there's people from one song that are millionaires. And that's another reason I don't believe in intellectual property, because once you put it out there again, I believe, you know, that's public domain. But I don't think that because you were able to write one successful song that that entitles you to millions of dollars. If you're able to do that by selling all these copies of it or people downloading it and paying it for you, then that's great. And I'm, I'm, I'm for whatever you, you know, as much money as you can make, you, you know, that's fine. I don't believe in any limit on how much money people can make. But I'm just saying that just because you can write some hit songs, it doesn't mean you should be a millionaire. It's basically if you can sell them, you can sell them. And, you know, if you can sell enough to make that much money, then, hey, all power to you. But if you can't, then you can't. But again, as I mentioned earlier, until the world is fully robotic and everything, robots can do everything and no one has to work, period. There's no way you can have a resource based economy. And they go into, of course, you know, climate change and the like I said, the resources and scarcity of resources and make making sure that it's sustain you know the sustainable development and that they have enough to sustain themselves uh, all over the world and sharing resources with countries all over the world and that's what the UN was talking about that different countries should share their resources and just pretty much give them away um and you you can't <laughs> you can't successfully do it. Not only that, it just it's asinine, I believe in my opinion. Now, maybe I'm just, you know, for as somebody who thinks totally out the box, maybe I'm not thinking enough outside the box. But I don't believe so because I believe what this does is it is totally anti-freedom and it stops people from being able to be as successful as possible because if you are able to you know work hard and and go to college and get a doctorate from Harvard and whatever and make you know a couple million and buy a giant house and buy a fucking Porsche, then that's your right. Somehow people want to talk about your fair share to the government. There is no fair share because the government doesn't deserve any of that money. You earn that money. Now there are people that have inherited money, but somebody earned it somewhere along the line there are people that have done shady shit to get money, and I'm not counting selling drugs or alcohol because I don't have an issue with that. But murder or they have, and I'm talking about businessmen who, you know, maybe they murdered their partners in the 20s or, you know, during the Industrial Revolution or screwed people during that time in order to um, get family money, and I'm sure that's happened as well. But the other thing is it could lead to a total black market economy and which I believe it would. And people would try to get things on the black market that they couldn't get from their controlled stores. I, I feel like this whole thing is like the Soviet Union from what I've heard about the Soviet Union. Now, I don't have a fair representation of the Soviet Union and what it was like. Although my great-grandparents uh, left there right before they became communists. 
um, when they were like 13. But all the stories I heard, it, that's exactly what it sounds like. And then you're going to be forcing this the same way the government does, using force on a whole bunch of people that don't want anything to fucking do with this. And to me, if they tried to force something like this on me, that's where uh, we'd have, you know, a, a war going on. So, um, I, I, I don't know. And the fact that, you know, they have all these followers and this cult like following, um, and it's so similar to the UN and go, go to the UN website and, and read their 2030 plan. They also did a commercial that I had played with uh, Jennifer Lopez and all of these other people. And let me actually find it real quick. But, um, you know, with the UN, it pretty much their plan socialist, it's collective. It, this is what it has in common. And, and I'm just getting into, you know, the beginning of it, but it, it's socialist, it's communist, um, well, I don't know if I want to use the word communist because th there's different interpretations, but it's, um, sorry, collectivist is what I wanted to say, not communist. The other thing is it, it's a world government, um, and it would definitely be a world government in, um, the both plans because they'd want to do it for the whole, um, you know, world. So to do that and you're sharing resources, you're sharing them with the whole world, which means a world government, which means world laws. Oh, I don't know if that was that commercial. No, this was the uh, total enslavement of the planet. Here, I'll play this anyway, um, and then we'll wrap up the show because I think it's important to uh, play because these are very similar. And then next week, I'll probably do a show on this because, uh, you know, I know a lot of the stuff that I looked at, to be honest, it was a couple years old, but this whole thing with the... The one I read, the 2015, was a couple years ago, and now they just updated it. And the commercial they did was in December 2015, which has only been a year. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, to me, it's some scary uh, shit. But it's also the same thing with Positive Freedoms that they feel entitled to health care, food, housing, sustainable development. Um, everyone would have the same thing and sharing all resources from rich and poorer countries. So let me play this and maybe I can find that quick commercial um, and then come back and we'll wrap up the show. Nonpartisan Liberty for all dot com set to meet with Vladimir Putin next week in New York City. Obama is set to meet with Vladimir Putin next week in New York City. That's right. Now, if you look here, look at the words that they used. Now, President Obama and Russian President Vladimir Putin will meet Monday in New York. This will be their first encounter in nearly a year amid growing tensions between the two countries. So they're not going to meet. They're not going to talk. They're not going to uh, conspire or work together, they're going to encounter each other. That sounds dangerous, doesn't it? Now, Putin is scheduled to be in New York for the United Nations General Assembly, where he will speak Monday. Now, the United Nations has different regional headquarters and headquarter districts, such as Geneva, Switzerland, Vienna, Austria, Nairobi, Kenya. But New York City has the main headquarters 
that contains the seats of the principal organs of the UN, including the General Assembly and the Security Council. That's, that's unique. New York, Manhattan is the UN headquarters. Even though the United Nations headquarters is in New York City, that is not technically United States soil. That is not U.S. property. That's not a part of this country. Technically, it's extraterritorial through a treaty agreement with the U.S. government. In exchange for local police, fire protection, and other services, the United Nations agrees to acknowledge most local, state, and federal laws. Most. Well, let's take a look exactly which laws they're not going to follow. Well, if you look over here, it says no federal, state, or local law or regulation of the United States which is inconsistent with the regulation of the UN authorized by this section shall, to the extent of such inconsistency, be applicable to the headquarter district. So basically, that's lawyer talk for saying that the UN will comply with whatever U.S. laws that are consistent with the UN. Now, whatever U.S. laws that are not consistent with the UN and their laws, they're not going to follow. So basically, they're saying they'll follow whatever damn laws they see fit. Just thought you might find it interesting to note that the Rockefellers actually bought the land that the United Nations headquarters sits on in New York City. That's right. A land developer, Zeckendorf, began buying... Hey everybody, Stacy on the right. Obama is set to meet with you where they got it, where it came from. He held at the UN headquarters where I just showed you where they got it, where it came from. The whole background there began on Tuesday, September 15th. Now, on September 25th, 2015, His Holiness Pope Francis will be addressing the UNGA. That's right. The, that's the 500th day, the 25th, when the Pope will be addressing, I mean, that's climate chaos, remember? Now, from September 25th to 27th, the summit for the adoption of the post-2015 development agenda will convene. Yeah, I'm going to get more into that in a minute. Now... The general debate for the 70th session of the UNGA will take place from September 28th to the 6th of October. Right here is the 28th. This is when Putin is scheduled to speak. Now, it's unclear at this point in time whether he will be meeting with Obama before or after his speech, or both, right? If you come over here to the links, it shows right here, officials highlight. Okay, so I found the uh, the clip that I wanted to play f with the commercial with all the celebrities and whatever. It's only three minutes long, so I'll play this, and then we'll wrap the show up. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We, we will live in a world where no child has died from diseases we know how to cure and where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school and education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if half the world is hit down. We will really live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone. Heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where our economies prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our work. best innovations are not just used to make money, but to make all our lives better. We will live in the world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and the extremely different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the threat of climate change. 
where we restore and protect the, the life, life in our, our oceans, oceans and, and seas. We will restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. An answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds. To make these goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations global goals for sustainable development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. So um, that was the commercial that they did. I played it before when I did something on the UN, but I'll have to revisit this next week and do a show uh, in more detail on Zeitgeist, uh, the Venus Project, and the UN and their 2030 plan uh, because there's stuff that I didn't get to and I kind of rushed through it, and I think it's important. I think they're more dangerous than the at least the UN than the monetary system. So um, unlike what they say. So we'll be back tomorrow with finally uh, the show on Adam Lanza. It's a two part show. So I'll have plenty of time to go through it uh, Wednesday and Thursday. And uh, thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate it. As always, I, I always appreciate when um, anybody tunes in. And hopefully I will or you will hear me tomorrow night. Thanks, everybody. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out.